Hey, home theater nerds. Thanks for pushing play on the Bright Side Home Theater Podcast. The podcast that's all about the sights, the sounds, the scenes, fun that we have in our theaters. This week's fun, Under Siege, 1080p Blu-ray. How does it stack up? We'll find out. To help us find out, I brought in Todd Anderson from AV Nirvana, and we break this down and we have a blast. If you guys like what you see, hit subscribe on YouTube. Follow me on iTunes. You can email me at brightsidehometheater at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter at brightsideht. Let's head into the theater and break this down. This is Brightside Home Theater. Under Siege from 1992 with Todd Anderson. How's it going? I wasn't sure which way I should go. Todd Anderson and Under Siege or whatever. But how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How were the holidays for you? They were good. Uh, good. You know, with COVID, it got a little weird for sure. Um, I got it. Oh, did you really? <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I mean, so many people have. Uh, yeah, we, we had it run, like, literally right through from a Christmas party. Yep. Right through my family, I, my in, my immediate family in my house, but it was with my family, my my family. We all got together on Monday after Christmas, and by Tuesday, mm-hmm. I had some, I was sick. Uh, I, I wasn't bad, but Wednesday, right off the cliff. Oh, I got it bad. That. Yeah. Wow. No, it's, I mean, it, it was bad. It was three, four days, and then I was like, okay, and you just... But my whole family, all different, very like variable symptoms and all different versions of it. Mm-hmm. Some people didn't get it, and some people it was crazy. It's so weird. I thought we were going to get it. I mean, we had a kid coming home from college up your way, and uh, my other yep. daughter's a senior in high school, and people were dropping like flies there, and a whole bunch of buddies of mine in the neighborhood, their families were getting it. <sighs> so we were just kind of waiting for it to happen. It just never happened. So, I mean, yeah, I know, I know, my. My wife never got it in the house. Like I went after like three or four days of having it. I finally went and got tested and they were like, yep, you have it. And the lady, the doctor, she's like, well, she she goes through the whole process that you have to go through for quarantine and like get your own room, uh, you know, have your own room. If you can have your own bathroom, start wiping stuff off. If you have to leave the room, but separate yourself from other people. And then in the middle of it, she goes, but you've been in the house for three or four days already, so it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, and it's the holidays. I mean, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tough. You know, when if you if you tough. got elderly folks involved or uh, yeah. p- anybody that has uh, any kind of really serious health issues, obviously, right? You got to right. be uber and that, careful. That's yeah. That's luckily my parents. My mom didn't feel well, but it wasn't COVID, and she didn't come to the party. So it worked out that like everybody that was there was younger and we're all able to handle it so yeah man we we'll can't f- wait till this we'll- is over oh, i don't think it'll ever be over i think it's just going to become part of our life kind of like the flu is yeah, and i think so i too. mean and we're I, gonna i guess to i meant over it. like not causing yeah. us to kind of close in and hang out at home when you really want to go out and see folks and you know right yeah be- uh, make it more acceptable livable. normal yeah livable yeah. exactly yeah. great way to put it totally all right, that was our COVID minute here on Brightside <laughs> Chat. Uh, <laughs> so other than that, hey, tell me about, I know this is kind of dating it, but tell me about this Yamaha. Oh, the, I, I read your review, but I want to hear it from you. It, it sounds really cool. You and I talked a good. little bit about it when you first got mm-hmm. it, but yeah. Yeah, that thing really sat cool. in the box for a long time. In fact, I have its little brother, the A4A, um, mm-hmm. just finished putting that through its paces. And uh, that's the next re- review that's going to come out. But uh, oh, cool! Yeah, the the so the A eight eight the A eight A boy, that's a it's a mouthful. It's yeah, the, it's the flagship <laughs> receiver from the flagship from the Yamaha. Yeah, uh, and yeah, I mean it's really powerful. It sounded so good. I, it, what was it? One hundred and fifty per channel. One hundred and fifty per channel. Driven. Mm-hmm. Blah blah blah. We, I saw that. And on it Twitter. can power eleven <laughs> channels natively. So all of yep. your past receivers required an outboard amp if you wanted to go up to a seven point two point four setup. This one yeah. does it all, 
and it's does it with confidence. And it, you really can't go wrong with it unless you're super picky about uh, room correction. You know, that's what I was going to ask you. How is it? It has it, it's it doesn't have Odyssey, Odyssey EQ. It has something called YPAL. Uh, yeah. Which is, so how is that? It, I, I mean, it does the basics right. So it, it gets the distances correct. It generally got the the channel levels correct, and then it goes through and it performs its own correction. Um, you can't preset any kind of target curve, which is a little bit of a mess in my opinion. But okay, uh, it does do some correcting, and if you have a, a calibrated microphone. You can, um, they give you four sub filters that you can adjust mm -hmm. the Q for the, the decibels, whatever the range that you're going for, and you can put filters in. So if you have any really bad issues, it's got enough there to take care of them. Um, yeah. I like Odyssey better. Um, yeah. Like D rack a lot better, but also, you really, if you have issues that are big enough to be worrying to that degree, you should probably think about, you know, treating your room or moving your speakers or whatever it may be. Because, you know, right. the electronic correction only goes so far. But I, I got to tell you, man, once the movies start flying, it sounds so good. It's just a really? very confident, powerful piece of equipment. Um, I'd happily, like I had told you, I'd, ha I'd happily keep it and use it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And eleven channels driven is huge. That's a lot. That's yeah, that's a lot. It's like I have that in my receiver, um, and that that was a selling point. Mm -hmm. Not being able to run eleven channels and not having to get external. Yeah. Um, my my first Atmos uh, receiver was an Onkyo, and it came. I could do nine. Uh, I believe I could do uh, maybe it was seven channels. I could do seven channels, yeah. but I could get up to eleven. Right. If I yeah, that's what it was. And it was funny because I ended up having to, I wanted Atmos, so I had to buy that external receiver, and I did. And I'm like, all right, well, what are you going to do? And you go down that, you know, you go down that amplifier rabbit hole of should I get just four channels or two channels right. for the, or whatever. How much power I had to get four right, channels. Yeah. So I was like, get five. And it's like, oh, <sighs> it's, oh, what a pain. Yeah. And it was like, actually, that's what it was. It was nine channels. You could run seven, two. Right. On that receipt, on the Onkyo. So you had to get two more if you want to have four right. overheads. Which most back then, at that time, that's exactly how it was. Right. Um, not many. I, I think Morantz probably was one of the first to come out with, uh, with, the that, 11. with that full 11. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Out, maybe Onkyo did eventually Onkyo, also. Yeah. Um, but I know, I Yama, I paid... you know Yamaha hasn't up until this point. But yeah. You know. Yeah. It's. But I ended up, like I said, you go down the rabbit hole. I ended up buying a five channel amp, uh, Emotiva amp, and ran my mains with that mm -hmm. and then did out the other ones. And, you know, it, it was a pain. And then what ended up happening is I had a guy come in and he's looking around my room and he was here to do consult for some speaker upgrades. Mm -hmm. And he said, You don't really need speaker upgrades. I was running smaller NAT NHTs than I have now. I had, uh, ones or zeros in the front the bigger ones in the front I, I always forget which one's bigger and then i had the smaller ones in the rear and he's like you need an amp you need a better receiver and he pointed me to the denon that i have oh, now. The denon, and yeah. he goes yep. with the odyssey eq and everything like that you don't even need that amplifier i go really you don't you don't think so and he goes no watch this and i upgraded to that and i was like holy with the oh uh, do you ever think what of a difference your, from the your mains camp. on that amp so dumping using pre-outs to dump out to that amp for just for i could amp. and i have and i messed with it and i didn't hear a difference okay yeah. i honestly didn't hear it between the denon and the denon amps and then this it's you don't hear it because it's a small room yeah and the speakers don't really demand the extra wattage and the cleaner wattage or whatever you're going to get from the emotiva right and whatever you want it's maybe there was a difference but i'm like eh, whatever if you can't hear <laughs> it i mean yeah, it just, it sounds so good to begin with, right? And then how do you improve from that? And like a lot of people say, it's like, when do I need that amp? And it's like, well, when you run a larger speaker that requires more power, and right. then, but do I need that in this room? No. So right. I'm happy where I am. Yeah, you, and like you said, so. it's a rabbit hole. You really, oh, it's brutal. You start getting the separates <laughs> and the money is just like, pew, pew, pew. Oh. 
and I want to do separates. I want to do more speakers. I want to do, I someday I want to do a turn off and I want to get those extra speed. I want to run as many speakers as I can. I love doing that, but I, I need a bigger room for that. Right. You know, well, it sounds so. like you're working in that direction. I mean, I'm trying, <laughs> <laughs> I'm older. I'm like, <laughs> I'm older and my, I don't have to pay as much for the kids anymore. Yep, so I'm going to do something. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got to so There you go. All right. Let's get to, uh, under siege here. And so this isn't your typical, um, home theater. This isn't, you don't hear a lot of people talking about this as a great home theater movie Mm-mm. because it, it kind of, it, it's grainy. The picture is kind of grainy at, at a lot of times. Right. For sure. Um, especially the dark scenes. Oh, yeah. the dark scenes. And, and the, the pulled back scenes too, like when they, of the ship, some of them will look good. Others not so good, but there are some scenes that looked pretty good. Like the closer up scenes of, of people. And especially if it's brighter, you had the bright white, you know, the whites, the uniforms mm-hmm. and stuff. Yep. Um, I, I thought it, I thought there were times that it looked the, the, you know, the 1080 P looked good. Um, but I thought the sound, was pretty good. What did you watch this on? Did you end up, um, do you have the disc or did you watch it a rental or something? I, I bought it on Kaleidoscape, so HD version. Okay. Yeah. So, so disc, that's the disc, disc version. basically yep. disc quality. Yep. Um, I actually went and rented it through iTunes to compare it a little bit. Oh, wow. And yeah. What'd you and think? It's not, it's, it, the picture is definitely a step down. Uh, we'll get, when we get into some of the scenes and stuff, um, there there's when they're shooting over the top of the deck mm-hmm. you could see some of the paneling on the you know the planks mm-hmm. of the deck it looked really nice mm-hmm. a little bit muddied that was one of the distinct ones mm. uh the sound was actually louder but muddier like all kind of blended together on the streaming it was but when you switched back and forth a bead you'd be like oh wow that's so much louder but everything was it was just it, it just didn't feel as is distinct and nice. The sound wasn't as good. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, and but also the they, disc they is really going to be clean. The audio. Yes. So I, I think that's the one thing that you're going to notice the most. Yeah. For sure. On the streaming side. Yeah. But interesting. Yeah. And then I also, did you upconvert it at all? Uh, no, no, okay. I ran it in, uh, I think it was 5.1. 5.1. Yep. yep. It was, uh, it's Dolby, uh, Dolby digital, just straight Dolby digital 5.1, even on the disc. And it, what, when I up converted it, I up converted it to with Dolby surround. Okay. That sounded pretty good, hmm. but then up converting it with the, uh, neural neural X yeah. way better. It, it was a noticeable difference. Really? I mean, they're both really good, but the neural X I, go figure DTS had a little bit more bass yeah. punch to it, it a little does. fuller sound. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then on top of that, it was the discrete sounds were just a little bit more discreet in the overhead usage. Uh, there's a couple of scenes that I'll talk about that have better overhead usage. It just sounded better. And I went back and forth between Dolby surround up mixing and the neural X and the neural X was every single time. It was like, you were like, Oh wow, that just sounds better. That's really interesting. I mean, they're both going to be great. You can't go wrong. But the Neural X, I just felt was noticeably better. You need to get that Oro 3D upgrade. I know because <laughs> Oromatic. It, yeah, because this podcast isn't long enough already. Oromatic, <laughs> I think, is better than both of those. That's I, what I'm. I hearing. would be curious yeah. to hear what you think of their up mixing. I would. I yeah. Hmm. But I don't. I have to. I think we talked about this in the past. Don't I have to install that Voice of God? And nope. do, don't I have to, to get true oral 3D? Don't you, aren't the speaker placements different? Yes, for true th- oral 3D, but they have an up mixer called Oromatic, which you can use with your speaker layout. As it is. As it is. Yep. I should do it. I think it's like, for, from Denon, and I think it's like a $200 download into my receiver. Hmm. I could get it. Yeah. But I, I should look into that because that would just be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, especially I, if I don't have to change my speakers. You don't have to change your speakers. Now, if you want the real Oro 3D experience, you would have to have uh, ceiling height channels in the front and back. 
Uh, you, right. you don't need the voice of God, especially in a smaller room. Um, okay. And it's really good. I mean, true Oro 3D material. We I don't want to derail us too much, but it's it's why not? It's really hot. I mean, it's it sounds so realistic. Uh, just because the atmosphere that it builds is layered in right. the way that we hear, so it doesn't oh. sound uh, kind of manufactured by Hollywood. It just sounds expansive, like you're standing outside, essentially. Yeah, you know? it's it's so sweet. Ugh. Yeah. All right. But anyway, pause the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to watch this again. You know, yeah, speaking exactly. of the speaking of the the audio though, I did note that I mean, it's definitely a little sharp. Did you catch that? Yes. Like tinny, a little tinny. Like, yeah, which yeah. isn't unusual for older movies, but this is a ninety two, right? So yeah, it's funny. It's like I, I would really. There were some great scenes here that could really use the up, uh, uh, like, um, the the uh, what do you call it? The four K upgrade. Mm-hmm. you know the remastering remastering it could there's some such nice scenes and well did you have a chance to get did you get my list of notes the email i sent i tried to send you the notes and it had trouble going through so you didn't get no, it i didn't ah, it'd be a surprise it had, it had pictures with it and everything it was great uh <laughs> sorry about but that. no that's that's i think it's my fault i had a lot of trouble with stuff today <laughs> internet wise so hopefully this whole thing's being recorded but um no, but all of the scene. I went through this, and for a movie that isn't that good, it was still. I found it was still so much fun. I found I found a lot of scene, a lot of scenes, twenty five scenes that I want to talk about wow. and right. go, yeah, that I thought were fun. And I don't know, I don't know, like, what did you think? Did you think that this was just horrible, unwatchable, no. or did you think it was still worth like checking out? I thought it well. Twofold. I mean, just coming from that era, um, yeah. there's a lot of faces in that movie. I took a couple notes on some of the actors that are in there that appear in other movies that we're all familiar with. Um, yeah. So I thought that was really cool. And I did not know that the director also directed The Fugitive. Oh, with Tommy Lee Jones was in that as well, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. As was another one of the characters uh, in the flick. Uh, so... I thought that was kind of cool because I like the fugitive. Yeah. That's, that's a movie that oh, I, I love of, the fugitive. I kind of dig yeah. back into from time to time. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, I thought it was fun. It's kind of like looking back in time and it wasn't so cheesy that it was terrible. It had its, it definitely had its moments and some of it was pretty hilarious. That was supposed to be yeah. you know, the serious moments that were kind of funny, like uh, Tommy Lee Jones getting his eye gouged out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, the, the, how bad that was at the end it like went yeah it's like all right let's let's start getting into scenes start get our recommendation is I, honestly i think it's a a really fun movie and if you rent it you're going to get a good quality experience yeah. i think the blu-ray is noticeably better for sure the the imagery is better the it's just a clearer picture uh, or a more clear picture my wife will kill me uh, the English major, um, and the sound is better, but it, but it's kind of exp- in my opinion, it's kind of expensive right now. The Blu-ray is 25 bucks on Amazon. Is it really? Yeah. Cause wow. I think it's just rare. I mean, like nobody's buying it. Yeah. So like, and you'd think it would be cheap. That's what I was thinking. I was hoping to go on Amazon and see that it was like seven or eight bucks and be like it, that. I would say would definitely worth picking up. Interesting. Um, wonder about but, eBay. 20, yeah, maybe. Maybe you can score on maybe. eBay. It's definitely uh, something that someone that enjoys these action, 90s action films should yes. have in their collection. Absolutely. No doubt. Absolutely. It's a, That's why I bought it. I'm like, I would love to see a 4K restoration of it. Give It It doesn't even need Dolby Atmos. I thought the sound was good, mm-hmm. especially being up mixed. But I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so, well, let's get into the popcorn is popping. Uh, let's get into these scenes so that we can start talking spoilers. And before we get into the opening scene and my description of what happened there, did you notice, I asked my son, my son had never seen this and we sat down to watch it and we went all the way through it and I was waiting for him to say it and he didn't see it. But did you notice or do you feel that this is Die Hard on the Ocean? Oh, totally. This is, it's, I mean, it is literally die hard on the ocean 
because it, there's other movies people compare to Die Hard because Die Hard kind of, you know, it it birthed all of these great like movies that had like a switcheroo in it and all of this and that and the everyman taking care of it, taking care of the day, saving the day. Yeah. Um, but this one here is so dead on. And it, I mean, it even comes down to Tommy Lee Jones's character, Stranix, of he is, um, what's his name from, from Die Hard? Hans Gruber. The bad guy. Hans Gruber. Yeah. He, I mean, even their motivation, what they're doing, and we'll get to the scene, but he even does the old, like, tries to give them every, you remember Hans Gruber starts telling, I want you to release my, <laughs> right. fr- you know, friends in arms. And while he goes, on, Tommy Lee Jones goes on this whole thing about, like, <laughs> We got a we got an inch of topsoil left, right? and they're all like in the war room. They're all like, "What, what? the I know. hell is he talking same, about?" Same deal, right? though, making these demands. It's exact. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, and they're and he's a he's a common thief. They're just stealing missiles for money, right? It's yep. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. It was. I just thought it was great. <laughs> I thought it was great, and I got I got a couple of those scenes listing, but um, the opening scene. That's where I always start with the opening scene. And I talk about like how the movies open and is it dynamic? Is it not? And this one here for a movie coming from 1992, I thought was, it was a lot of fun. It's the screen just comes in black, but you can hear the, the knocking on the left and the right. Did you notice mm-hmm. that? And it was up above, like to the outside the screen, yep. but up high. And it was, on the what was it on the left side? Let me see. I have it. The, the left side, I think, was the tinny one, and then the other, it was like a tink, 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 and then the other side was a doom, 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 and they went back and forth. And I thought that was really cool, and I thought it was maybe foreshadowing that the prisoners in the oh, mo- totally. in the movie, yeah, are doing the the Morse they code. Were doing Morse code to try and let everybody know, yeah, or let yeah. him know. I guess I don't know who they were. Who were they letting know? Because they all were jammed into that room. Anybody on the ship? Because he actually noticed some people were in a room. Remember, he oh, in, later right. on in the movie, yeah, he right. they they were using it and they were in a room. That was the and I got to that scene. I have a fantastic that we'll talk about a fantastic uh, movie goof. They made a mistake. Okay. Continuity error. Huge continuity <laughs> error. Pretty funny. Pretty funny. Um, but the score I thought was really good. The score comes in. And then that starts filling in and then it starts filling in around the room, the nice, nice base in the score. Mm -hmm. And then the ship, they, they show the ship and you start to hear the waves and the ship and the ship plowing through the water. Really nice base there. I thought, I I thought that sounded really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Agree. Yeah. Good. Really gets you into the movie. Yeah. 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 Um, the next scene at two minutes and 10 seconds, uh, phone call. I call phone hang up and it's when the the captain of the ship, he's on the phone and he hangs up and you're sitting there and you're watching it. And on, he hangs it up to the left side of the screen. That's perfectly placed sound right to the left side of the screen. Wow. I didn't pick up on that or maybe I didn't, I don't remember it, but yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do. I love that stuff. I love that stuff because it, I mean, those are the little things that we like to, to hear and, you know, you just, you're going through these movies like this and it's like, Oh, boink, drop that right in there. And it's it, the sound designers placing it perfectly right to where he, I mean, he reaches off screen to hang it up and that's where the sound lands. So, it, but like you said, it's like, you're not noticing it, but it's, it's there. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? Yep. It's like, it just feels natural. I thought that was really cool. Um, at three minutes and 42 seconds, this is one of the picture that I thought was really nice. And it's the image. Uh, it's the wide shot at three minutes and 42 seconds. Remember when they show it's the credits are still rolling. Um, but you got the ship coming at you right. with all of the crew lined up on the sides yep. because the president's coming and they're having the whole ceremony and everything. Right. And they're retiring the ship, right? Wasn't they are. The, yeah the story of that because we don't use battleships it's anymore like a world war ii era yeah i mean you could see the yeah. wood planking on the deck and as you mentioned definitely yeah. an old ship but the width of it and taking up that which was that's the other thing that i liked that i forgot to mention earlier is the screen it's it wasn't this cinematic screen it was the cinemascope it was this full you know, 16 by nine, 178 to one aspect rate. You got the full glory. And then seeing that image at, like I said, at 342, if you want to go check it out, 
it's like just that big wide ship it just looked so good and you're like oh it's yeah. coming at I you know. plowing through the water it's, yeah yep yeah it was so so cool um 10 all right this one here this is when um commander krill he's making his way he's heading down to the kitchen and he comes through the doorway and did you hear on the right side of your room and it wasn't to a speaker it was kind of off to the side but you could hear speaker announcements oh, to- oh yeah on Atmospheric's your right side in there yeah yeah awesome at atmos- uh, uh, awesome atmospherics <laughs> in that one um you listen around the room especially on that scene when he goes in and he first uh, approaches uh Steven Seagal like the Ryback and they're having their conversation listening to the stuff going on you hear clanging some banging going on there's a conversation actual people talking you can hear that mm-hmm. but also the 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 announcement the speakers that you would you know to the intercom system right. i should say going on through the ship sure really really cool yeah yeah no i mean they definitely made good use of the uh the surrounds in situations like that in those crowded rooms i mean there was a lot of activity going on in that kitchen also yeah right yeah they were, even to the point like when he's walking at you um that that is uh gary uh, uh Busey. gary Busey. he's walking at you and they're closing an oven and they go to the shot of him walking at you and you can hear the oven close on i think it's the left side of your screen you can hear the clunk as that goes on but then the speaker's on the right side of the screen right it's pretty cool right pretty cool um one that's not so cool you had to have noticed this. What screen, what kind of screen were you watching this on? Uh, 235 one. Fixed. Okay. You're two. Th- yeah. So you had, so it okay. was zoomed down to fit on. Okay. That. All right. And how big was that? How big of an image do you got? Uh, going? It's here? probably roughly like a hundred inches. Nice. Something like that. Nice. So you had to see this and it, it was awful. Is at 12 minutes and 22 seconds. I called it bad FX. Uh, <laughs> it's the, the cut on oh, totally. face <laughs> it just looks like plastic <laughs> it's like they just stuck it on and said shoot the picture <laughs> yeah that looked really bad i did notice that as he was walking away especially he turned around and he said something yeah it's, it's like it's feet. almost flapping off yeah like you could see the edges so of the bad. sticker that they put and then the blood running down trying to hide it but it was just so like there was a cut in the middle right and then then you could see all around the image, like all around the side was just like all just like peeling up. Right. Like bad wax. Right. <laughs> well, and plus they, they had gotten into that scuffle. Right. And like yeah. minutes later, the blood is dried. Yeah. It's, yeah, oh, yeah. it's just like dried those two little lines. Yeah. That was bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it bad. So, it was so bad. Which is it a was, little it, surprising it, for a 92 film. I mean, 92, they were coming out with some decent. There wasn't a lot of butt in the budget for the, uh, <laughs> for the makeup so. crew, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it was just really, really bad. That's hilarious. Um, but it was fantastic. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, I know that when I reviewed Jaws, they, I mean, that's 78, I believe mm-hmm. when they did that one, it's like, you could see when they pulled up the shark that they thought they have and it was strung up. Right. You remember? Yep. You could see that it's obviously it's fake, but you could see the eye on the side of it is done with a Sharpie, like literally oh, really? drawn on. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Go to that scene. That. I've noticed it I looks rubbery, but yeah. Yeah. If you look at the eye, it's not a black. I mean, even a dead shark with the eye open, right? right. It'd be glossy. Right. It's still, a, it's still an eye. And this is obviously they've like. <laughs> It, they literally went on with a black marker. It's you can't. I mean, it's you can't miss it. So and you, you got to know that in in the seventies they were like, who the hell's ever going to notice? Nobody. You know, I mean, if you were in a time machine, you'd be like, well, hey, um, the people in like fifty years from now with four K and high resolution, what's that? Watching it over and over, <laughs> over and over and, and over. over. Yeah, and I think at that time they weren't thinking of those terms, right? They weren't sure if it was going to get made. Right. <laughs> that one. <laughs> but yeah, they definitely weren't. They definitely weren't. Yeah. At 13 minutes, 17 seconds, this one here was where I really used the up mixing, really compared the up mixing. It's the rotors, I called it. And we're inside the helicopter and Erica oh. Elenick and Tommy Lee Jones are coming in. Yep. And when they first pan in, 
you see the helicopter coming to the ship. It's the dual rotors, right? And you got that nice long shot. Actually, it was a pretty good looking shot. It was, yeah. Then, then you go inside the helicopter and you get the conversation between the two. But the uh, how was the how was the sound for you? Like, did you hear like the rotors over your yeah. head? Yeah, it was elevated. Yeah. Surprisingly so, but definitely. And I, you know, I'm glad you mentioned this because that sound, the helicopter rotor sound, is my favorite home theater sound bar none i mean i love really i love it i love movies that have the helicopter i mean uh uh lone lone survivor has some great helicopter rotors um deep water horizon has a has a great helicopter rotor scene uh also uh What's the uh, Black Hawk Down? Black Hawk Down. Has some great, <laughs> Just because I was waiting for that it's one. That, that thumping because you, frequently yeah. you get a little bass. It's deep. Yeah. And yeah, it just really resonates well in my room for whatever reason. Sounds yeah really expansive. Love rotors. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of a weird thing and, to like, but it's one of my favorites. Yeah, but it's it, uh, but it's it really lends itself to Atmos for one oh, having does. that those overhead speakers. And this is one that was very noticeable when I swapped between the Sur- Dolby surround up mixing and the N- DTS Neural X up mixing. Um, again, the Dolby surround up mixing sounded good. And it was like, I, I was watching it in that and I'm like, okay. And then I went to the DTS Neural X and I was like, oh my. It's like, really? so there, yeah, the, it was just, again, like you said, the rotors have that deep bass, right? That the foom, foom, yep. foom. it's not a pump. It's not like this type, like that hits you, but it's a, there's a thump to it, right? It's like an air concussion, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Just as pounding. it's go, boom, 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 yeah, just pounding. And I just felt like the the neural X, it gave you a little bit more of that, and it utilized the overheads more, giving you more of a sense that you're in that in mm-hmm. that helicopter. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas I felt like. Obviously, if you're not A-Bing and going back and forth like this, they both sound great. And you're just going to be like, oh, it sounds like it's over my head. But it felt like the Neural X brought the sound a little bit more to the middle of the room. Right. You know what I mean? Whereas the the Dolby Surround felt like it was, okay, it was mostly the sides, not as much overhead usage, not as loud. Hmm. Whereas maybe the Neural X actually pumps a little more volume out of the overhead speakers. So it gives you that little bit better sense interesting and obviously you're getting a little bit more out of your subs yep. it's 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 boosting your base ever so slightly mm-hmm. um it's just really really nice but it, either way it is a fun scene it's that just that you feels like you're in that helicopter so funny that they're talking inside yeah. the helicopter i mean if you were in that helicopter you can't no <laughs> no no but that's a, I, I mean that's a great point too the dialogue was crystal clear Crystal everything clear. we were just talking about about the overheads and all of that bass and everything that dialogue was crystal sure. clear it's not like you were like what did they say i can't hear but which is the way it should be right but yeah yeah that's a great point i didn't even think of that that you they have no headset on none they're just they're just talking to each it other it would be so deafening back in that yeah. hall i guess you would call it the seating area yeah. that they're in I mean, it's yeah, just she's like putting steel. on lipstick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> like that's I, I've never been in one of those, but I can't imagine it's like sitting in a parked car. No, like it's hard to put on lipstick in a moving car. I know. Never mind a helicopter coming in. Chop. And to begin with, she's she ends up getting sick from the ride. Right. So it's not smooth. Right. But she's like, I'm just gonna do my right. lipstick here. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So funny. Her character was. I don't know. I'm going to get, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was fantastic. I, ha, I, I time stamped the scene. So okay. we'll talk about that because it's fantastic. Yep. It's funny. It's <laughs> we'll get to it, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, and the helicopter rotors. One more thing. I didn't time stamp this, but when they land, right. And then the crew is coming up to the helicopter and they're, um, they're putting in the chucks and stuff there. When those rotors start going slow, I, I wish I did timestamp, but I do remember it. There was a boom overhead. Oh, really? A single, yeah, a as really it, nice. As it slowly. Yep. It was really nice. So when it's landed on the deck, you can hear it as the people are walking under it. And it went boom. Like cool. a boom. And I was like, oh, wow. That was, it, it, it was way more distinct and singular. So it was really, really cool. Cool. 
All right. This one here gets into the story of it, which is we, you laugh because like story to under siege, <laughs> but, um, at 21 minutes, 24 seconds, I called it commander green. So I said, uh, in this one, this is when Tommy Lee Jones hit uh, shoots. This is when the action all starts. Right. And Tommy Lee Jones shoots the highest ranking officer in that room. Right. Right. Did you ever notice that that's the giveaway on how much knowledge Tommy Lee Jones has? Because we find out later that he is part of the intelligence community. Right. Naval intelligence or whatever, yeah. or, you know, whatever. And, but in this scene here, he just, he's supposed to be the rock star. That's what we know him as. This is the big reveal that he's, these are the bad guys, right? And he's like, he asks, he's up there acting like a rock star. He's got his black leather jacket on. And he asks, who's the highest commanding officer in this room? And this guy stands up and he says, I'm the highest commanding officer here. He goes, and they're like, what are you? And he's like, the operations officer, third in command. That's all he says. And then Tommy Lee Jones reach back, reaches back and says, it's a pleasure to meet you, Commander Green. And he shoots him. Oh, so he knew who he was. He knew his name. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's like, it's a little giveaway that he even knew who he was, right? Mm -hmm. And that actually plays out later for um, Steven Seagal's character too. Because you just, obviously, we're supposed to think he's just a chef. Right. right. <laughs> but it's just the idea of that is like, you know, first time you're seeing this, when I saw it in the 90s in the theater, and I'm like, oh, okay. But he calls him by name commander green i didn't pick up did, on that yeah i had to go back and rewind it to see if anybody says commander green or anything like that but he just says commander green and then shoots him in the forehead but that that gunshot it's not a devastating bass sound but this is where i think like you were saying earlier the the tinnier sound mm -hmm. the sharper sound mm -hmm. but there was a nice echo to it and it sounded it sounded like it was in a, a metal room, mm -hmm. which is, I suppose, what it's like to be on a battleship, correct? Yeah. I mean, all those walls, which makes it really funny if you think about the fact they were playing a concert right. in that room, and it sounded perfect, right? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. You know, you know how awful that would sound? <laughs> it would hurt. <laughs> yeah, so everyone would be like, turn it off. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I don't see a lot of like room treatments no. on the walls of a battle. It's just metal, basically. It's, yeah, right. It's just metal. They're they're all rocking out, and, yeah. and but yeah, but that gunshot, it was really really cool. And then the chaos starts, but it doesn't it it doesn't overwhelm, mm -hmm. and you you just hear people moving and running because it's not like everybody just starts opening up. But when they go to the part where um, where all the got all the cooks and stuff that the the catering crew they all reach under the table and pull out their guns. Right. Um. Nice security. Right. And right. Like, ah. uh, <laughs> but yeah, they pull out their guns and everything. You can hear all the different people around the room start to ch -ch 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 things right. are going on all around Gun you. Gunshots are going Re off. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, a little bit, not a ton, because they they're they're making a um make it a point. They're not just there to kill everybody, but they're, you know, if you, if you get out of line. Right. Uh, but yeah, a lot of fun, fun sounds around a lot of good ambient sounds of the chaos going on, but you could still hear the dialogue very clear, locked up front. Really, really cool. At 23 minutes and 22 seconds learning experience. And this is where you get to Tommy Lee Jones shoots that one guy because, because the first guy, um, the big, the big black guy, they attack him with the gun and then he unloads on him. Right. And then Tommy Lee Jones shoots the guy next to him. And that's when you get the, we'll not only kill you, but we'll kill the man next to you. Right. Um, but that single gunshot was, re had really nice bass to it and a really nice echo. Cause they're in that like hallway area there. Um, but you could also hear the ticking start. And remember we were talking earlier at the opening that goes throughout the movie at different times in the different, you know, but it's the same on one they of the were right, already, one of the left. They were already tapping at that point? No, no, no. This is all part of the score. Oh, part of the, yeah, 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 the yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, because I, I thought the score was a lot of fun. 
Totally. And by the way, that the really big guy that they had, the big black guy that was the like, big black guy. Yeah, yeah. He did nothing. He looked like the most <laughs> menacing, equipped guy of them all. Like he would just rip somebody's right. head off, forget his gun, throw it. He did nothing. I mean, he goes down with a no. whimper. <laughs> it's yeah. so pitiful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, I like to, do you want to get into a little bit of the, are you a fan of Steven Seagal movies? I wouldn't say a fan. I mean, I've seen some of them, but he's not somebody that I ever followed per se. Oh, I loved them all. I like, you know, what, uh, what was the first one? Uh, Above the Law, oh, yeah. I think was the first one that he did. And then after that, I just loved that. And then I, I started following, like, you could read it back then. There was no internet, but you could read in articles and stuff. Like, uh, was it Aikido was his uh, martial was his art thing. of choice. Right. And he he's really good, too. Not just for the movies, but he's uh, multi multiple degree black belt in Aikido and stuff. And what I always thought was funny, though, what's interesting about Aikido and is that it's a defensive martial art. It's right. like the the idea of it is you let them attack and you will use their momentum and whatever they're doing, their body against them. Right. So it, it's not very offensive. So what you end up with, and if you watch a lot of Steven Seagal movies, watching him get in a fight is he stands like he, he, he reaches or steps away from them, puts his arms up and it almost looks like they're going to get in a slap fight. Right. Right. right? Cause he's constantly just like, Moving yeah. his hands around, right? Right. Just to just to take them. And it's like all he's doing, and, and that's what Aikido is. It's like he's not doing it wrong. He's doing it perfectly. But it's like grab them and they're just like, because when you reach out to punch, your momentum's coming forward. Well, his job is to grab that and take that momentum and keep it going forward. Now you're off balance, and he, obviously you see what he does it's to you. But mind. it always looks like a... <laughs> well, it's funny it's because like, some of the, uh, the MMA... Folks, I know like Joe Rogan has commented that yeah. Steven Seagal would just get smoked if you put him into it, the octagon. Yeah, it's uh, there's uh, there's a huge debate on that because uh, so a lot of MMA, a lot of like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is I've never taken a keto, but I've I've done a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And the idea of that is the exact opposite. OK, so somebody's going to attack you. You do the exact opposite. Like, so say you and I are in a fight and or you are like, oh, I'm going to kill. And you're like, get your hands up. As soon as your hands come up or you feel that threat, I feel your threat. Boom. I'm right in tight on you. And I just pull you down. And then I just smother you. And that puts people off balance right away. And like, so like what Rogan's saying is right. Is that like when I, if somebody wanted to threaten you know, Steven Seagal, all of a sudden they would just get in tight on him. And he's like, what do you do? He because be like, a key. Yeah. You'd be like, <laughs> you can't do it. You'd be like tapping you on the head, you know? So, but at the same time, if you came at, he's a, he's an expert at dealing with you coming at him. Mm -hmm. So if you came at him, he would probably find a way to counter it, but it would be your expertise trying to not get taken advantage. Of. I think it would be a very interesting situation. It's too bad. He's so old. Oh, well, I'd yeah. love to see it happen, but yeah, never see it happen. No, no, it's it, but it's a two different theories. One's back up and use the momentum. The other one is get in tight because they can't hurt you here as badly. And then you take advantage and now you take them down and smother them. Mm -hmm. So obviously though, if Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, if somebody's got a weapon, it's tough. They got a knife. It's hard to get in tight on that. Right. You know, that who knows? So. I don't know. It's just, a, it, but it is a fun debate. I've had it with many people and you go back and forth and I've had it. I've had it with karate guys. I, I was, my family was taking karate with, uh, um, uh, he was a uh, Kempo karate mm -hmm. black belt. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the time. And I was probably, I don't know, second belt, whatever. We didn't have belts. We were just messing around, but we were taking it and he go, and I was, explaining exactly what i'm explaining here and next thing you know right in front of this guy well his class is waiting in the waiting room to come in and we're messing around on the mats and i just came right in shot in on him took him down and i was like this is what i'm talking about he's laying flat on black belt laying in kempo flat on his back like oh but he'd never experienced brazilian jiu-jitsu so right you know what i mean it's a disadvantage if you have no experience 
the guy with just a little experience, I don't care what belt you have, it's going to be weird to you. And that's what happened. So I've seen a lot of the different. old Gracie films. Yeah. Of him taking people down like the 70s, 80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the, the Gracie family's point. huge. Yeah. Yeah. Gracie family's huge. It's like, I don't know if you followed MMA and uh, like the original in the 90s of um, UFC with Hoist Gracie. No. Okay, so but I'm Hoist familiar. Gracie. I'm familiar with the the Gracie family. I've heard yeah. a few of them interviewed, and yeah, they sent Hoist to to the UFC to dominate the UFC, and he was like the third ranked in the family, third or fourth. Mm-hmm. He wasn't even the best family fighter. They, he has like three of they have like four or five brothers or whatever family members that that basically developed this Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And they were like, oh, we'll send the little guy down, see how he does with them. And he dominated it. It's like nobody in, nobody in North America had a clue on what this was. Wow. And it, it, yeah, so it was, that cool. was in the 90s. Yeah. But it was, I mean, you could see the jujitsu in, uh, at the end of Lethal Weapon. That's what, that's what he's using. That's what Mel Gibson's using. And Gary Busey, by the way. Really? That's, that's jujitsu. Yeah. When they're fighting on the front lawn and the sprinklers, the, yeah. the water's going on them. Yeah. When he gets up, he got he ends up getting him in a a triangle uh with his legs and then he ends up on arm bar. It's when you remember when Mel Gibson was like on the back of his neck and his legs are up in the air and he's For holding sure. his arm. Yeah. And then they fall to the side and yeah. he has his neck. Well, in that position there, he can choke him out or he can break his neck just with <laughs> his knees. And cuz he's got his arm locked up here and we've Boy. done that. It's like when you get a guy in that, you're like, "Ah, how do you get out of it?" And you're just so locked in, but the idea is you just squeeze your knees together and you choke them. That's pretty progressive it's, for lethal weapon. Yeah, it's very accurate. And that was in the, that was what, 84? Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, Brazilian jiu-jitsu has been around a while, but that was legit. I think they even say jiu-jitsu when they say, oh, you're like, new, you know, jiu-jitsu, blah, blah, you got registered as a lethal weapon, whatever. But I think they use the term <laughs> jiu-jitsu too. But <laughs> most of us, I was like, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. It wasn't until I was in it that I started seeing it. I was like, oh my God, they're doing they're, it. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, it's pretty accurate too. That's yeah, cool. it was pretty good. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. So what are, we, what are we on for scenes here? Oh, here's a cool ambient sound, the phone conversation at 28 minutes and 38 seconds. You were talking earlier. So this is when that uh, poor guy, uh, Private Nash, who's <laughs> he called him a what dipshit or whatever. <laughs> when uh, when um, Steven Seagal's in the meat locker yep. and Private Nash is guarding him, yep, okay. but he tells Private Nash to call the bridge, so he does. And that that conversation go he keeps jump you know jump cuts back and forth between the kitchen and the bridge, and. That's what your room, it's so much fun if you're in a dedicated room or if you have, you know, a good system going on in your living room, you can really hear those ambient sounds and how much different they are. And like in the kitchen, when he's on, when Private Nash is on the phone, you hear all just the, like the vents Uh going on. Sure. But then you go to the bridge and you can hear beeping and computers running. There's a different, like a fan noise to a computer type Mm -hmm. thing, plus the vents. And just jumping back and forth was just really cool. And you could hear that. And it's like, what volume did you listen to this at? Uh, oh boy. Probably about 10 decibels below reference. So, oh, okay. I'm decently loud. Yeah. I always go to reference for the, for everything so that I can. Wow. I mean, if you always listen at the same volume, you'd still get kind of the same effect. Mm-hmm. You'd know if it's a little low, a little high, this, or that. But I always try to go to reference. Um, there was a movie recently I was watching that I actually had to turn it down. It was just too, too loud. But um, most of them, I, you know, everybody in the house knows what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my wife's always laughing at it. Like, all right, here we go. I get a text. A little loud down there. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> But it, when you go to, up to reference like that, you get it really brings out all those ambient sounds and stuff. Really, really, like just everything's like accentuated even more. Yeah. I think. Anyways, I really wouldn't cool. disagree with that. Yeah, this one here at thirty-one minutes in the reefer. That's when they go into that. So the mission, uh, the terrorists or whatever you want to call them, the uh, 
What 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 are these bad guys called? I don't know. I think you um, call them terrorists. Mercenaries. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they kill Private Nash mm-hmm. once he tells them where he is, and then they go into the refrigerator. But when they first go into the refrigerator, you see them. The camera goes into the refrigerator first. They just start shooting inside the refrigerator, right? right? Just taking out boxes and yeah, and you see stuff shooting everywhere. And then they go. The camera goes inside the refrigerator, and he comes in from the right side of your screen, right? And the gunfire is on the right side. Really cool because it's coming from the gun, right? But the left side of your room is the <laughs> of the bullets hitting. Right. Very distinct. Yep. Really nice. Yep. Yeah. I like that scene a lot for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and again, this is one where uh, when you up converted it, when I up converted it, the, the Dolby surround still nice, but the dope, the neural X just had that fuller, especially in the sound on the left side of the That's room. Really interesting. The, I'm going to have to go back and do that once I, once I get this uh, receiver back out and put my regular system back online, I'll go through and yeah. Yeah. And play around with what's your regular system. Uh, what's your regular it's a storm audio processor. Ooh. And, uh, you. yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun to play with. And, Ugh. uh, I've got eight, eight, uh, high channels and seven, eight? seven multi channels. So- Oh, okay. So, what are your height channels? You had eight like overheads, or eight, eight, eight like overheads. four overheads, and then the two. Uh, so four are uh, front and back, right? Top ceiling tops, and then and then I have uh, one directly over the seating, and one about uh, five feet forward of the seating. But the way it's oh, wow. configured in the system is uh, when when Atmos is engaged, it uses all eight speakers. Oh, wow. uh, for at, but yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's seamless movement of sound from above. So if you have a, have you ever heard the uh, Atmos demo disc? Yep. As the helicopter yep. going around the room, it's just perfectly seamless as it goes around. There's no, oh, wow. there's no sound gap or like dip in decibels as it's kind of moving from the back to the front or whatever. Um, right. So, so I, I have that, and then I have the you know surrounds, rear surrounds, the three front and four. Four subs. It's, it's how big is the room? Uh, it's eighteen by thirteen. Oh, that's a, but it's a decent sized room. It's decent size, but the subs are really there just for the over the overhead. You know, it's just to have that headroom. Yeah, you definitely want. I mean, I have two in this room, and my room's like eleven and a half. You know, by uh, eighteen. So it's roughly not the very same, big. roughly the same size as yours, as mine. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I got two SVS uh, PB two thousands, mm-hmm. and they're, they're way, way too much they for this can't. room. But oh, yeah. I wanted, I, I could have got away with the one thousands, but I wanted that extra depth that you get in the decibels. I think the the two thousands go down to like sixteen. Yeah, I think, and I just wanted that. Gotta and like it. you said, having that headroom. It's you never you're never lacking, and I mean, it's when I get a bigger room than this. Hopefully someday when we do the addition, I want to run four. I want to run you know four big subs and well the even what you that. get is this evenness of sound, yeah. right? So that's the main reason why I have four is just to really even out. Oh, of course, everything. But I mean, it's so overkill. I've got uh, dual sixteens on the front, so the SB sixteen. Uh, oh wow! Ultras. And then the back, yeah. I have uh, Power Sound Audio. Okay. Um, they're an older model, but they are dual opposed, fifteen inch drivers on each. Oh wow! Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's so overkill. It's not even funny, but it That's sounds. Really, it sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. I mean, when it gets kicking, it's pretty right. Pretty rock. I mean, it's really really cool. So uh, most of what we have is overkill. Oh, one hundred percent. As yes. as case in point, the 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 Yamaha RX uh, A four A that I'm reviewing, it sounds really good. I mean, yeah, you pull anybody off the street and sit them down, they would be like, "Wow, this is amazing!" Even though it's a uh, five five uh, multi channel with two overheads. It's a oh seven, yeah, seven dot one channel receiver, and it still sounds really really good. 
So I've said to so many people, it's like there, there becomes a point when like, it's just such small incremental improvements that when you go from something like, but you, but we appreciate that we yeah. can hear that stuff, right? Yeah. Most people, most people can't hear the difference or see the difference in a $20,000 like system say, or a $20,000 picture yeah, or a $1,000 picture. Yeah. I, like, I, I happen hmm. to live with those people. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have, I had a listener. I talked about it earlier this week. Um, I had a listener email me and said he had, you know, he had some disposable income over the, during the pandemic. And he's like, I, I had some time on my hands. So he, he upgraded and bought three TVs for his house. And he bought a led TV, an OLED TV, all different levels. And he wanted to see the difference. Wife didn't see a difference in any of them. She thought they were all the same. And he's like, oh, yeah. and it's like, but that's, that's how, no, and I end up saying, he sends me this email and I'm poor guy. I end up sending him this really long email back saying like, this is my life because I'm like so detail oriented. It's the way my brain works. So I've always seen these little things. And then as you get better at it, you start to see more and more and more. Yeah. But I also understand because of that, like my dad always taught me like the world doesn't see things the way you do, you know, it was like, <laughs> And I understand that. And you, you have to like, and when I go to help people do in home theater, and this is what I was saying in my podcast earlier this week is that it's like, you don't want to just send them to the best possible stuff right away when they're first getting into it. Cause they, they don't even know what they don't know. They don't even know what to appreciate yet. Right. And you they know? better, they may never get to the point where they even care to go Ever. further. Yeah. Right. They may never. And, and then they're just happy having, because I and the reason this came up is I always recommend to somebody when you go into a first big image, right? You've had a sixty-five inch TV, but you want to get it bigger. I want how I doesn't matter what what's the best TV for me. The best TV for you, and I always say this is the biggest you can afford. Just <laughs> find find the go size big. you can fit, and then I don't care the quality doesn't matter because when you first go to that biggest size you can get. You're just going to be so blown away with that size, right? And then, then what? It's like, then you're like, then as the year, you know, and I always say like, give it a year or two. And if you start to see flaws, start looking into asking questions. How do I make this part better? Mm -hmm. Then you upgrade to the other TV mm -hmm. that maybe you, but like you just said, most of the time, they usually just blown away with the large picture. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. TVs are getting so good these days. Yeah, I mean it's legit. Maybe his wife really didn't see a difference because they don't know what to look for. They don't know. Well, they don't know what to look for. They're also getting pretty good, though. I mean, it's amazing what you can get for a thousand bucks versus two thousand dollars. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but then you go up into the. I mean, I'm starting to look at, and I've said on the podcast a bunch of times and online. I mean, I'm, I think you and I talked about it. The new 98 inch. You know, ninety eight. What is it? A ninety eight inch uh, Sony TCL. The oh, the TCL. The TCL ninety eight inches, and it's only eight thousand dollars for ninety eight inch. I'm sure it's not the best quality, but I mean, we had this conversation a couple of times ago when we were when you were on about you know pick you know o OLED versus projectors and mm -hmm. the compromises you get out of. Uh, using a projector the image quality and stuff and which is where i i would love to get a hold of one of these tcls and be able to see what the image looks like compared to a, a decent image from a projector what about one of those short throws the ultra short throw lasers i don't i, I haven't heard i haven't heard them compared to anything i've never seen one they're good right they're good but uh, how do they stack up against like the JVCs and the better. So oh, no, 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 they're but, not that kind of good. I was speaking right. in terms of a, if you're looking at like a 98 inch TCL. Yeah. You might be able right. to get a, a short throw that would put up like a 120 inch image for five grand. Right. And it's, but that's what I want. I wanted to see, like I have the entry level 4k Sony mm -hmm. with the Lumigen attached to it. What am I getting? I know I'm getting a really good image out of that. Yeah. How does that TCL stack up to this? Mm. 
I, I don't know. Good question. You know, yeah, because black levels are wait, probably a little better. Yeah, exactly. I black. I would think your black maybe, levels are going to be better. Maybe, maybe the color is not as good, not as accurate. Yeah. I don't know. There's going to be, you're, you're giving up something. Yeah. But for eight grand today, and I'm, my screen here is at 110 inches. So we're not far off. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Sony, is it Sony? Who? Somebody has, maybe it's Samsung. Samsung has 110 inch available. Uh, that you can buy today, but it's like tens of thousands of dollars. So does Crazy Sony. Money. Sony has a new one out that's like a, a hundred. I think it's 110 inches. Yeah. And I, I, that one, I think, is uh, is that 16 grand? It might be. It's a lot. Two, I mean, far more than I would ever pay for a TV. But if you're trying to get, I mean, people are paying that for a projector, right? And if you can do 110 inches on a dis with a display, you're going to have better black levels. You're not running a Lumigen through that. You're not running a video processor through that because you're getting the full gamut. Who knows, right? That's so you're, true. Pro you're, you're saving money. I'm thinking at 16, between my projector and, my, and the Lumigen, your price tag on that, your retail tag on that is about 12 grand. How many, so, uh, how many zones is that TCL? have i don't know i didn't be I, curious I don't. to see i'll have to i'll have to go look and see because you're talking about a huge area right so yeah in dark scenes if you don't have a lot of zones it's it can't be edge lit there's no way they're edge lighting that but <laughs> no. you, you would end up you might end I up with not. some yeah that would i'll have to go look and see um it's an interesting idea for it's sure a good comparison that's what because that's the market you're going for um well, actually, I think it's, I think by the getting bigger panels like this and being able to bring those in, I think it, it makes the, um, I, I said online on Twitter that I think you're going to start to see a lot more, um, dedicated home theaters popping up Oh yeah, because it's just simpler to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, don't you think like a lot of people, like when you say, Oh, how do I get a nice big screen? Well, you got to get a projector. So you got to get a screen, you got to run the cable, you got to do a it's a non-starter. People are like, ah, eh, never mind. <laughs> Let alone know how to use the projector properly. Right. I mean, these yeah, are things that you just turn on and just use for the right. most part. Right. I for mean, you do, part. but you have to be into the hobby and willing to tweak. Tinker. You got to go in and tweak things in the menu systems and, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. It's not like you bring home your TV, you, you mount the stand to the back, turn it on and go, all right, vivid mode, go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if only it so, were that easy. Yeah. But I think if you get a 110 inch display and the prices start coming down, you may start seeing receivers going up, you know, sales going up. You see dedicated rooms because you're not putting 110 inch in your living room. No. You know, no, it's, well, I you, mean, somebody might be doing that, but not many oh, people man. have that kind of space. Exactly. Exactly. So it's uh, that's why I think uh, that's where it's going to go. And then if the quality is there, you, that's when you start to see projectors go away. Yeah. Because people are like, why do I want, like my, my media room with all my gear in it is on the opposite end of where my projector is just because of the way the, the house is designed. Right. Mm -hmm. So I have to run at least a 30 foot cable to my projector. If it's on that wall, I'm running a short right into the display. Boom. You're done. And it's, it's just mm. easier, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I'd like to see it. All right. Let's get back to a scene here. And this is a really nice one. 33 minutes, 53 seconds. The F-18. Yes. Uh, Which, by the way, sure. just a correction, it's an F-A-18. Oh, is it? Yeah, FA stands for fighter attack, which is what the Hornet is known for. It can dogfight and it can bomb. Oh. So when they the second they said that, I was like, "Come on, these are the <laughs> these are the military leaders, and they're saying F eighteen. It's actually F A eighteen, and that was a oh. good shot of it too, as it's flying." Yeah, well, when they first when they first alerted to it. The the guys on the bridge are like, "We got an F F eighteen coming in." That's what they said. I was going to correct yeah. it, but they actually said we F18. can stick with the F eighteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, so you hear about that, but then when they they jump cut 
to it flying by. You get the boom, almost like in Top Gun when they go to afterburners mm-hmm. or whatever, but you just whoosh right across. It's not a huge pan across your screen, but you just get that nice, you know, thunderous sound come yeah. into your room. Yeah, I like a, that scene. With a whoosh. Yep. Yeah, there's definitely really a, cool. a good feeling of that. Yeah, you got that because it's an outside shot with the ship and you really get that sense of space. Yeah, at, uh, at 3455 is the flyby when this is obviously before they shoot it down, but it, it comes at you. You're looking at the front of the ship mm-hmm. and then the fa-18 comes in you know from from the stern Mm -hmm. Uh uh-huh comes in from the stern (laughs) there you go (laughs) and then it flies down the starboard side Uh uh-huh i learned for this just for this it flies down the right side of the ship the starboard side of the ship and but that's on the port side of your screen It's the left side of your right. screen, right. but yeah. the sound was really cool because you heard it coming from the center and then it starts as it, it appears from behind the ship, the sound shifts to the left side of your screen Yeah, and then it jump cuts away before it could actually fly by you. But it was a really nice half screen pan of that sound of the FA-18 going, whoosh, you know, and it's, I mean, it was really, really cool. Very cool. Unfortunately, that guy... He's like, ah, I don't see anything. Boom, gone, right? No, they, no. are you locking on me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> Flying his plane. Eh, okay. Kind of silly. Then, to, I mean, they, you know, they send them in and they don't send any more to kind of be in the area to keep air traffic out of the way. You know, yeah, when no, does an F-A-18 go out unsupported? I mean, Ever? No, I doubt. I mean, come on. In real life? Yeah. It was kind of hokey. I, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. It's I remember 9/11 and they sent out fighters out of our area mm-hmm. and I remember hearing and it's like then you start hearing the rumors from military people and then I mean it was online and stuff too but supposedly once they hit that tower we had planes from I don't know if it was Hanscom up here or one of the bases up here and they were in New York City inside of 5 minutes. Yeah. Without and weapons it, on them, though, right? Yeah, and it was, but they just, they, but they got them out, and it was two of them, from what I heard, and it was always two of them. Yeah. So it's, I'm just bringing it up because here you got this one lone F-18 flying yeah, around the flying ocean. Around, yep. Yeah, it's hey, out there. Oh, yeah, it happens to be out there, right? Yeah, no, I, definitely a little hokey, but, but played to the movie. Sure, sure. My, I mean, my immediate thought is. If that was really happening, wouldn't they just sink the ship? But then they, well, that they have was all those that was part of the story. They right. were trying to save the the people in the in the uh, uh, fo- forecastle, right? Because right. everybody's trapped in the forecastle. They were trying to save the crew, and they're right. like, "We could just sink this ship." And that was the purpose of him saying, like, of um, Tommy Lee Jones trying to stall for time. Because if he just told them that I'm gonna, if they knew I'm just gonna unload these tomahawks. They would have just sunk the ship like that. Right. So he was trying to stall for time and they were trying to be like, oh, okay, well, maybe we can take the ship back. But they're, because remember at the end, he says, call off your planes because they had bombers coming in. I guess my, in my head, my first go-to option is just blow it up. (laughs) Just take it down. I mean, the crew, yeah, just take it out. The the crew, Erica Elenick. (laughs) Oh, God. The world would be a much sadder place. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> um, at thirty six forty eight, Mister Breaker. <laughs> this is this is the guy, Tom Breaker. He was the head of intelligence in the war room. Okay, and this is when we first get into the war room. And this is another scene where tons of great uh, ambient sounds. It's another scene. So we were in the kitchen so far. We've been in the ship. We've been in the, you know, on the bridge, you get those different sounds, but this war room, you can hear like a radio conversation going on, like somebody, like a CB radio conversation speaker going on, on the left side of your room. You have ventilation going on in the war room. You hear typing going on, on different sides of the room, beeping on the right side, typing on the right side, just really another ambient scene that had great, Mm -hmm. you know, engagement around your room. And, uh, and this is where. 
the, the, the Hans Gruber type thing. This is where we first hear when Stranix has this conversation with, remember he was like, uh, this is Tom, Tom Breaker. And, he, and then um, Tommy Lee, you go, Tommy Lee Jones talking in a microphone. Looks like he's podcasting the way the microphone's uh, yeah, hanging down. And he's like, <laughs> and he goes, Oh, hi, Tom. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, he, like, he's like, Hey, how you doing? He goes, you tried to kill me, you know? And it's like, but he starts talking about Tommy Lee Jones, talking about global warming and changing the world. And it's like, you know, it's, and everybody in the war room's like, what? Like, what's he talking about? You know, not much different than, uh, the rock with general Hummel. Yeah. Calling in. Yeah. Right. And they're like, yeah, yeah, Hey yeah. Frank. Yeah. 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 There's, what's going I on? Gotta... We got some really worried people down here. You know, it's the same. They took the same scene and just bent it into, uh, yeah. The rock. Yeah. Which was exactly. what, 96, 95, 96. So a few years later. And it was the rock. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. You're right. Uh, at 42 minutes, 38 seconds, this is the, <clears throat> the planks on the ship where you got, you got that nice long shot mm. of them just going down the length of the ship and yep. looking at the deck of the ship and seeing those, di the different colored plank, cause they're all, you know, they're all brown, but mm -hmm. they're just the different colors and, um, or tones, I should say. But then when you went to the, the the streaming version it those planks the detail wasn't there as much it's like a, it i mean on the blu-ray you could almost make out like the grooves yeah. in each plank between each plank yeah, right for sure 100 percent. and then but on the streaming it you kind of lost those little darker lines it looked a little bit mu muddier a little bit more digitized as you went down the shit still looked really good but it's it was going back and forth you could definitely see there was a crisper nicer image mm you know on the disc and it, it is a it the entire movie the shots of the ship are really I mean, beautiful and yeah. it's like they did a lot of you know justice for that ship and making it look as good as it did and this one long shot going down looking yeah, down on great. it it's kind of a fly it was it was from port to right was starboard it? to port i think you know they went it was coming uh, from the rear and then you you started at the rear and went to the front of the ship and that's, then because you started to see it plowing through the water that's right, and then that's they, right. they trail yeah. off over the front of it yeah and it, it just oh and it was it, again it's just the detail was so nice and that that's at 42 38 i highly recommend checking that out and these are ones that wouldn't it be re i wish it had the popularity or somebody wanted to do it but a, a 4k restoration mm -hmm. how good would that look Pretty darn good. I mean, yeah. yeah, because there's definitely a lot to work with. And they have the they have the foot. I mean, if it's shot on film, so the film there's no K, there's no right. resolution to right. film. They it's can just pull there. anything off it that they want. Yeah. So it, to be able to get that, it, I, I don't. I'm not even. It just. I think it would look so so good. Yeah. I mean, this does. Like we said before, there's a lot of flaws with this. You know, the Blu-ray. There's a lot of grain at times. Yeah. There's, you know, when we get to that scene in the knife fight and <laughs> you get the special effects there weren't very good. <laughs> kind of go along with Gary Busey's scar on yep. his face. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, it does. It looks so, so good at times. Um, but speaking of looking so, so good at 43 <laughs> minutes and 20 seconds, I labeled this one gratuitous. <laughs> yep. It's because here's the thing: you got Erica Alanik, Erica El Alaniac in it, and that cover on Playboy. She actually was in that Playboy. Oh, was she? That was real. Yeah, that was oh. real. I was watching this with my son, and I was. They remember at the beginning they show him walking on, and I'm like, and they're like, "Hey, she's a Playboy centerfold." She actually was on there, oh. and um, I want to say that was the reason they almost didn't. She almost didn't get her job on Baywatch because of it because they didn't want uh playboy um centerfold on baywatch they wanted a family show a family show in bathing suits but uh but yeah that was yeah, that was the cover <laughs> and that was the issue that she was in that they actually used in the movie hmm. but then when you get to this dancing scene what i think when she comes out of the cake yeah and it's like what's so funny is like we need a way to get her topless in the movie right and it's like he kicks the cake 
And then she comes out of it. And it's like, what was the cue for her to start dancing? Right. I know. It's hilarious. <laughs> like, you know, how long has she been sitting in there? She, We're 43 she, minutes she into the movie. She said that she was drugged. Yeah. She, so she was probably asleep in the cake. Right. And then and she's then, all confused. Yeah. She's all confused, but comes out and starts dancing perfectly. Right. I know. I know. <laughs> it's like, and the music is cued up. I know. It's like, hilarious. What? It's like, all he did was kick the cake out of the way because it's in the way, right? right. So Steven Seagal kicks a cake, cake on wheels, slides across the room, and she, like, comes out of it the way you're supposed to come out of a cake right? with the music blaring and she just starts dancing. There's nobody in the room. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> what you, it makes no sense whatsoever why anybody would do this, but they had to, but it, it, nobody cares. Right. It's like yeah, the guys going to see this it. movie are like, that's what I'm here yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm here to see Steven Seagal kick butt and Erica Ellenick to do her thing <laughs> now doesn't he doesn't seagal take off his jacket to put uh, on her yeah well she had yeah she had a jacket on she had the sailor jacket on that she took off and right. then she puts she sees that there's nobody around and there's a gun pointed at her right. so she covers up right and then he covers her up and they go into the room and you know you have a conversation which just cracks crying. me up because he's got like this like green He's got the army green wife beater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, yeah. You know, and his arms are oh, like from all, Die Hard. Yeah. Or tan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he has a gold chain, right? It's hilarious. Yeah. They've got that oh, yeah. scene. You know, the other thing I noted about uh, Seagal, every close up of him had this soft white light. Perfect. Did it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go oh. back and look. I'll have to look, check that it's out. Like, yeah. It's almost, I was wondering if it's like a requirement of his, of how they shoot his face. But yeah, all these scenes, you know, when they get that up close of him, there's always this light just perfectly cast. That's funny. Right across his face. <laughs> just a soft glow, you know? Right. Well, it's kind of like, remember uh, Moonlighting? Mm-hmm. And they'll, show, they'll yeah. show Bruce Willis's face, right? His face was like, like a guy, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could see the, you could see the stubble, you could see the wrinkles in his face, right? But then they go to Sybil Shepard yep. and it was like, they didn't clean the lens. It yep, was like very soft, like yeah. very soft, like a filter over it. Like, ah, like yep. even the light behind her was glowing differently. Every because it was so they just threw a filter over the camera on her. Yeah, and it's I, like, <clears throat> I think they were doing the exact same thing for Seagal. They were just yeah. giving him that like godlike heavenly look, right? You know, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Go back and check it out. It, you'll, I will. Once I you will. pick up I on will. it, you're, you see every all these scenes. You're like, wait a second. Well, what's funny is I'm actually, I have it on right in front of me. Oh, do you? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. I've, I've got it playing. I'm watching it as, you're right. It, there's a, I just, <laughs> they just showed a scene. They're in the, um, they're looking at something at the bridge and then he's just looking up and he walks up, but it's like they have a nice soft spotlight on his yep. face. Yeah, so exactly. Like, and I, just the scene, because you're saying it, I'm watching it. Uh, oh, this is the scene here that I'm actually watching. They're actually, uh, they're flooding the, the forecastle. Oh, okay. Okay, so he's going, Seagal's going to see it up on the monitor, but as he walks up and looks at it, he's going like this and he's walking towards it. The light never changes on his face, <laughs> to your point. It's like a soft white light going there. So somebody's off camera with a, like a flashlight pointed at his face. That's hilarious. Isn't it? So great. Uh, I would love to know the backstory on that. I'm sure Seagal's agent oh, yeah. was like, you got to light his face up. <laughs> 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 exactly real quick um, if we if we can rewind um sure what do you got in the engine room they go into the engine room and they shoot this guy in the stomach kind of a heavy set guy yeah 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 that is uh joseph casala okay he's in the fugitive the fugitive he's yep. one of the chicago cops oh at okay. the end of the movie goes you shot a cop you're going down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Remember that? That's yeah, him. Yep. That's the same guy. That's him. Makes me and wonder sh- how tight he is with the uh, director, uh, uh, director Andrew Davis. Maybe, yeah. It, it, so did he get killed? Is he later on in, is he any more of Under Siege? Or is that it? Does he get shot in the stomach and he lays No, he's fine. He goes back to, I think he's down in that room that's getting flooded. 
he's in the, okay well they actually lock a bunch of people and we'll get to that scene there's a huge mistake the continuity error when they actually save those guys that were they weren't in the forecastle they were in the um the, in a just a different room right you know that they right. locked they welded like the door shut people. right yeah, yeah 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 i don't think he was in there i think they tossed that guy that they shot yeah uh, yeah. yeah so cool yeah cool um this scene here at 5633 more than a chef this is that scene that's very much like when um uh, this is steven seagal big giveaway here so we're into the we're in the war room and they're having this is when steven seagal first calls him on the sat phone you know it's like oh like a cell phone he's like yeah cell phone um but he's talking to the war room right and the, <laughs> but captain after, Gar- after he's in that boat in the boat like all lit up yeah, and he's in there like boop, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and he's setting up the satellite thing and everything and then he sneaks away and he's like hey i got it all set up now he's got a mobile right. unit yeah well right. so obviously we know he's got some kind of training other than being a chef at this point i don't think they've said it at this point but the depth of his knowledge and the and how high ranking steven seagal's character is ryback it is it's given away here big time but it's very very subtle and he's talking to captain garza remember the guy he's in the war room and he's like i'll stand up for him i this is a good guy and he calls him chief ryback right not chef chief so (laughs) but then he goes when he introduces himself to to steven seagal he goes hey this is uh captain ryback here and he's like oh and seagal replies with glad you're there captain meaning like i know you and i'm glad you're there like i'm glad you're in on this right that's one giveaway very but this one's huge he goes in it in again it's a little subtle because it happens so quick they start talking and seagal's character gives them the breakdown of what's going on and um and then the captain garza says all i want you to well, all we want you to do right now is just you know keep feeding us intel and and then steven seagal interrupts and says nick this may be crazy but and then he goes on to explain call him by his first name <laughs> yeah and when does that happen not cap not anything when does that happen in the military one that he knows his first name and then in the military, you'd call a superior officer by his first name. Hey, Nick, he how you doing, buddy? Respect. Yeah. And yeah. by the way, Captain Garza, that guy has been in a ton of. He was in Saving yes. Private Ryan. I mean, he's just another face in this movie where you're like, that guy, right? Yeah. Lots of military movies. Oh yeah, there's there's a bunch of them. Yeah, but yeah, that guy there, he was he was awesome. But I thought Dale that was Dye, I think his name is. Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I thought that was really, then he called him Nick. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't pick that, up on that. Yeah. It kind of jumped out at me in this, on this viewing. And I was like, holy cow. I'm like, huh. Huh. um, one hour and eight seconds, mineral spirits. And this is when Steven Seagal blows up, booby traps the helicopter with the thing, a <laughs> lack of thinner right. and the grenade so and it grenades. goes off. Oh, how many grenades awesome did he have? Base. I don't know. He just kept finding them on the floor. I think. And he knew what to do with them all. It's amazing. Every single one. This one here, and then the one where he booby trapped the door. Right. Both great base. Nice yeah. concussive base. And it seemed to like it 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 exploded off the screen and the sound actually moved through the room. Mm-hmm. Right? Starts at the front and then moves to the back of the room, which I thought was really, really cool. It's your diehard moment, too. Yeah. He's he's jumping off in the explosion. Yes. You know? Yep, yeah. he jumps off the side, doesn't use a fire hose. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uses, <laughs> but he clangs on the side of the ship. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I didn't I didn't pick up on that one, but there you go. Yeah, yep. another diehard moment. Yeah. Um All right, this next one at 1 hour 4 minutes 30 seconds and did you pick up on this? So Ryback is th- this is where Steven Seagal and Erica El- Elaniac, they save the people, they they unweld the door and they mm-hmm. go in and they're telling and you got that one guy that's like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just here for the college plan. And then but I don't know, like, I haven't oh. had a shot of gun and blah blah blah. Right. Yeah. Right. But 
he um, Ryback looks or Steven Seagal looks at this one guy and he calls him Ranger. I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's his name. I think he just calls him Ranger. And he goes, Ranger, you know, he's like, you take this. And he hands him an Uzi and Ranger takes the Uzi and he looks at it like this, like hmm. weird. Hmm. And he even looks at like the, it's got the uh, back extended, the, uh, what do you call that? The little handle flip out. Yeah. The, the, it, so the shoulder yeah. brace. So he looks at that and he puts it in, but as he goes like this with it, right? What we're missing, what's going on at one hour, four minutes, 30 seconds. If you can, the first person to tweet or email me what we're, to, what Todd and I just talked about, I edited it out of the podcast so you can't hear it. But when somebody says it, I'll tweet the video of us talking about the scene after somebody guesses it. But the first person to guess it right gets the blue i'll send a blu-ray copy of under siege and wow. yeah and i want you to come on the show and tell me about the scene i'll have you come on the show just like here and we'll put that video out on youtube of you describing the scene your theater whatever and we'll we'll just have some fun but the winner is going to get a blu-ray copy and get to come on the show and talk about that particular scene and whatever else you want to talk about at the time sound cool it's a good giveaway you you can't win todd because you already know <laughs> do i <laughs> well you already have the movie <laughs> uh, so yeah that'll be pretty cool i'll edit that out and edit that together but awesome. that'll be fun for people so hopefully people will take advantage of that yeah definitely all do. right yeah so uh all right one hour, eight minutes, 14 seconds, drop anchor. Pretty self-explanatory, but really cool sounding and looking scene. Yeah. It's a pretty cool way to shoot it. But the yeah. sound here from the different points of view, like obviously when it's first dropping, it's coming at the chain is coming at you. That's the most distinct, like you're out on the deck and hearing it go by. But then there's the sound from the, the prisoners here from inside the forecastle, which is right up at the front how did it sound on your system it sounded like it was going over my head and down the left side of my my room i think in my room it was more forward okay and lower it was i did not have that over the top sound uh like like with the the helicopter blades okay but it definitely sounded good yeah. um and I, I did like how it shifted as as they took the shot around the boat. You could definitely hear that, you know, clanking oh, yeah. of that heavy chain. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it snapped to a stop, it like, gung, gung, yeah. it, that was really, really nice. Yeah. That's the fun part of doing this podcast, too. I get to make fun noises like, <laughs> <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Uh, all right. Um, one hour, 24, 24 minutes, 30 seconds, the different rounds. This is a fun thing to go back. I don't, the different sounds that you got when they started firing on the um, on the sub, and oh, yeah. they, they they shot a five inch starburst to start to start. And Are you, you skipping just, over the uh, the guns, the cross with Seagal. No, down. I we don't have to skip it. What about them? Hilarious, is it? I mean, my son, it? he's like got his arms crossed with Uzis. Just yeah. running down the hallway, just bah, 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 just firing off. Right. So my son and I actually talked about that while we're watching the movie. And he goes, why is he crossing his I arms? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, I go, here's my explanation. See if you, if my son's big into guns, he's a, he can name anything, okay. right? He, he loves studying them. He loves watching YouTube videos on them. I mean, I mean, all of that stuff. He's a huge fasc fascination with guns knows all the names and he's an engineer who wants to design stuff like that. Anyways, he said the same thing. And my explanation was this, you're running down a narrow hall and there's guys on the sides going, crossing your arms like this and shooting the guns. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that easier than going like this? I guess. You know what I mean? Like, because, like, if you go like this, you're aiming too far forward and you're probably not getting into the doorway. But if you go like this, it just, you just cross. I don't think he did it because it was, and it's stupid. This is in a movie, right? No kidding. But it, I think he did it more practically just to get those inside those doors ahead of you. Well, he did, and he does turn. 
a couple yeah, times that's... To, to angle it. He's like, <laughs> bah, 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 bah. Right. I don't, know. I don't, it didn't seem like he was doing it. Like you put it, you hold an arm to brace it. I don't think he was doing that. I think it was more of just to spray the actual sides. Yeah. Cause it's easier than taking your hands and putting your wrist together. You know what I mean? It's like for people just listening to this podcast, they have no idea what we're talking about, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, like, that's yeah, it, it, it is hokey, hokey. Yeah. But, but it's fun. Fun. Nevertheless. Fun. Yeah. And some good sound too, is he's running down that hall. With the yeah. bullets ricocheting and everything. Yeah. Um, There's a ton of that. And that's like, like I said, I have 25 scenes. I know I miss them because I try to get to, like, I see my things. And if people have different, like you, you brought this one. That's awesome. And when he, I do know that scene, he's running down the hall and you can hear it on either side of your room. Yep. As he's running down the hall. It's, yep. and it's, but it is, it's tinny gunfire. It like is. you said, it's not it's, as good as what you're about to talk about. Yes. Right. So, yeah, one hour, 24 minutes, 30 seconds, the different rounds. First, the starburst goes off, and or the five-inch starburst, and it sounds good. Mm-hmm. It sounds nice. It's got some deep, but but not too deep. But right. it's just a nice shot. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a movie from 1992, all right? And that's why. Then, at one hour, 25 minutes, and 15 seconds, they fire a five-inch shell. Right. And this is, I mean... This is what blows out Tommy Lee's eardrums and the blood coming down. (laughs) But wow, the deep base. I mean, going, jumping back and forth between these two are, it's a lot of fun. And if you have, you know, two subs, one sub, four subs, (laughs) it's, it's a huge difference. It's a good one. Yeah, definitely. And also, by the way, lots of fun to watch Gary Busey running for his life, trying to get down. Well, yeah, try yeah and well that's my next scene is where gary Busey's like here's this the shell coming the final shell that sinks them right and it, at one hour 26 minutes and 25 seconds i called it whoops because he just they screwed up because they they took for granted they're like oh they don't have anything it's just a starburst don't worry about it but then you hear that shell coming in after he saw the first one just miss but this is another one where you can hear it overhead like you're inside the sub, you know, you're looking at Gary Busey's all red, you know, right. you got the red lights on inside right. the sub, but you can hear that whooshing overhead. Um, how did it sound in your room? Good. Really good. Didn't get that direct overhead, but it, it was enough that you had the the sense of it. Yes. Um, it, I'd like yeah, to go it, back and hear that up mix though, to, to get that flying yeah. overhead. Yeah. Cause that's how it felt to me. It felt like I could hear it coming almost from the right side to the left side, like a very subtle. And I think a lot of that is your own brain going like it's maybe it's going this way. I don't know. It's my memory from right now, but it definitely did sound like you were inside the sub and you heard the whooshing going by. And then the sound of when the sub exploded. Good. Yeah. 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 Very good. Nice, nice, powerful explosion. Yeah, another one that moved from front to rear. The explosion comes off the screen. You can hear pieces landing behind you, like in the ocean or whatever, but just great, great full room engagement. Lot, Lots of fun. Just, I mean, that's it's a good scene. Definitely. Um, One hour, 28 minutes, 45 seconds, launching the missiles. So Tommy um, Lee Jones fires on Hawaii. What? What did I miss? Thing. The most ridiculous point of the entire movie is after they sink the sub, all of a sudden the, there's like five of them. Yeah. They're on the front of the ship. They've got their arms around each other. They're all just hanging out, just watching that sub burn. <laughs> like nothing else is going on. You know, you've, meanwhile, you've got like these spotlights on the ship that are just constantly moving. And they're just like, there's like this shot of the five of them, like, they're all like oh, yeah, singing kumbaya, you know, just right. hanging out. No one's looking around. Like, is anybody coming to get us? Right. It's the ridiculous factor is off the charts. Yeah, because Tommy Lee Jones is still there. Yeah. I mean, they've taken care of most of the mercenaries. But they have no the idea, part. right? Who, they have no many... idea how many more. So they fire these guns off, and then they just go out, and they stand on the deck, and they're all like, yeah, look at that. Look at that. Yay. We yeah. <laughs> High five. <laughs> College plan. Woo. I know. It's so funny. I'm still alive. <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt. I just noticed no, that part. Don't. That one scene, I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. 
Oh, there's so much ridiculous in this movie. Let's not, I mean, let's, you know, I mean, but it's, that's what we like. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and to be for a Blu-ray, it's, it's just fun. It yeah. is fun. Yeah. And it's like, that's, yeah. I was honestly surprised when I was done. I call it stamping out a movie. Like I watch a movie from beginning to end without stopping it. And I have a little stop and I time it and I, t I use my phone and I screen grab the stopwatch. Oh, and that's okay. where I know where my timestamps are. Okay. So I never have to lose concentration on the movie. I just know that when I get to a part, I go click, I, you know, screen grab the, the scene, not, not take a picture of the scene, but screen grab the timestamp. Okay. I sync it up when I start the movie. And uh, okay. I see what you mean. You so save a I start the phone. movie and then 10 seconds after the movie is started. So 10 seconds into the movie, I hit stopwatch. I hit the start on the stopwatch on uh, your iPhone, you right? Just take a screenshot. Of your okay. Of my phone. So like when you get to the cool. two minute and ten second mark when he hangs up his phone, mm -hmm. right? I and I he, I hear that and I'm like, oh, that was cool. I pick up my phone and I just hit screen grab and it marks it at like roughly two minutes and ten seconds. It might be off, but then when I go back through, I'll know what did I see here? And I, mm -hmm. and that jogs my memory. I mm -hmm. get there and I see what it is. I, I thought like the movie I did a couple weeks ago or last week, it only had, it was, a, I did a half hour podcast. It was, yeah. um, <clears throat> it well, what the heck? Oh, they live. They live. Yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. It's great. It's actually a better movie, I think, than Under Siege, the movie itself, but it's still, it's an eighties kind of bad acting. Da, da, da. It doesn't have great special effects or anything, mm -hmm. but it, it's a fun movie. But it, was, it only took me a half hour to do the podcast. Mm. And then I stamped it out, and I'm like, oh, it had only a few scenes in it. This one I thought would be similar to that because it's an older movie. But wow. I mean, I had 25 scenes when I was done, and I'm like, holy crap, I got a lot to do here. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. Which is good. To me, yeah. that's, a, that's a good and, you know, entertaining experience. Yeah. So. Um. But yeah, so at one hour, 28 minutes, 45 seconds, launching missiles, Tommy Lee Jones fires the cruise missiles on Hawaii, and the sound of the launching is great, but the pans as the different characters on the ship, they you hear it going, and it's like just really, really nice yeah. pans going yep. off, which yep. I thought were really cool. This is one that I think a nice 4K HDR when they get that long shot at night of the ship in the dark and the missiles firing off the side. That would I look think, really good. Oh, it would look so good. So good. Yeah, they did a great job with that scene. You know, they also did some shots of the monitors inside yep. the ship. Yeah. You know, they have those camera, I don't know, technical terms, but it's always like a grainy camera. Yeah, so yeah. The, so they can inside inside the deck, they can see the the missile launching off. They, so they did a really nice job of capturing that. What's moment. going on? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really really cool. Um, this is a hilarious scene. This falls. In, you'll I you'll like this one. One hour twenty nine minutes fifty two seconds. The war room finds out that they uh, fired the two cruise missiles at Hawaii. And and that that one guy in the war room that's super annoying the entire time is like heavy set guy round yep. face and he's yep. like, what does this mean? Right, right. right. Oh yeah. <laughs> so the camera pans around this round table and it goes around to this one guy that it has I don't I don't know what branch he's with but he's got like the braided thing off of his shoulder. <laughs> right. And the camera stops on the side of his face and he goes dead serious. He goes. Approximately one million people will reach ten thousand degrees Fahrenheit right. in less than a second. <laughs> so Dead serious? Like, what does this mean? And then he's like, "Well, I have the statistics right here. It means that approximately one million people will reach ten thousand degrees in less than a second." But now, he says you, it dead serious. Did you catch in that war room how they were getting their updates at the table? This guy would run up with a red folder. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of like getting a text message, right, of instant information. Well, Ninety two, yeah, the yeah. Instant information was coming perfectly Off a laid printer. out in this <laughs> folder. So they'd come in and rent it, and they would go like, "Oh my gosh, guys!" <laughs> 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 so funny. Well, how about how about the launch codes to to disarm it oh, when you get to the scene? Yeah, and they go, they're like, "Okay, we're gonna play this by the numbers." 
well, how else would you play? Right, it, right. right? <laughs> and he goes, we're going to give you the codes. And I liked that uh, Erica Eleniak's, char- Eleniak's character had the wax pencil to write right. on the board. I know, I know. And as the numbers comes out, she knows enough, like, I'll write them down so that Steven Seagal can repeat them back. But did you see, to your point of the folder, it's like, okay, where are the numbers? He goes, all right, here are the numbers. And it, you see him look, and he goes, where? Oh, okay. All right, here they are. And he finds them on the piece of paper. Like, right. Hawaii's about to get blown up. And they're like, did we highlight this? Does somebody want right. to highlight this, please? <laughs> and Steven Seagal in that moment, too, when he reads those numbers back, he's like, yeah. one, two, three. Right? Yeah, he yeah. He says it's so like it's slow, slow. And like, it's like, can you go any slower? <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. So funny. It was so great. All right, couple two scenes left. One hour, 33 minutes and 47 seconds. As ridiculous as the end to this was, this is the knife fight between Tommy Lee Jones and Steven oh, Seagal. Yeah. But it sounded really good. Those it's knives it. clanging together, and they yeah. actually do move around your screen. I thought that was very, very well done. It's a good very, it actually entertained me even more. And thinking, like, I know Steven Seagal is really good with the martial arts, but seeing Tommy Lee Jones and him go head-to-head like that, I thought they edited it really well. I thought the camera shots were really well done. But that sound of the knives going, ting, 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 ting. I thought that was so cool. All the little cuts, too. You have that sound. Yes. Yep. Again, that's kind of to the point, like kind of like what we were saying about the ambient sounds and the jump cuts on the phone call and stuff, where Mm -hmm. you go from one room to the next. Well, you get the tick, 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 but then he, he, he stabs him in the uh, leather and you get the, th- a yeah. little sound there. Yep. He cuts him up the front. That's has one sound. He cuts him on the, the arm and that has a different, has a th- different yep. sound to it. And you get all these different sounds, but they are, like I said, very subtly moving across the front of your screen back and forth. And it was just a lot of fun to that, that again, you watch this with a sound bar in your living room. And, eh, okay. You're not going to get that. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It was great sound design. I was still, though, the whole time thinking, why didn't he just shoot him? (laughs) I mean, he's got this enemy he knows is a lethal weapon, right? Right. Navy SEAL guy who's a total badass. Why didn't he just come in the room and go, boom? Right. Well, when he first, when Stranix, when Tommy Lee Jones first comes up behind Steven Seagal and he's got the gun to his head. Mm-hmm. And and he he comes. It's like, oh no! Well, this is where we have to have the whole bad guy part. Right, where the bad guy explains the entire story to right. you. Because right. to your point, they and, and you know what's so funny? I'm watching it right now. Tommy Lee oh, Jones yeah. on my screen <laughs> just appeared. But what I did like about that scene was when he came to a pole in the room, he reacted like correctly like he had to take the gun he had to move his arm up and then put it down really fast so remember when he so he's coming through the room and there's poles in the room and he's got his gun trained on steven seagal but the Mm -hmm. poles in the way of his forearm Mm -hmm. so he would come across the room and go really fast and it yeah it was really cool but to your point should have shot him because i don't know i don't know if i know this from um the uh, audio commentary back in the nineties, watching the laser discs or whatever, but they know the reason he is on this ship is because of Tommy Lee Jones's character. That's part of the backstory. Remember they say earlier that um, he, uh, Steven Seagal lost his seal team. Yeah. In what was it? Cambodia or something yeah, like that. Yeah. From bad intelligence. Well, the intelligence was gathered by Tommy Lee Jones. That's what he does. And oh, one of his okay. things he knew. So that's why in this scene here, they say they know each other. There's a whole backstory to these two characters. And that's another reason why he doesn't just kill them is because he does know, they know each other and they don't like each other. And he holds it. I'm saying he, cause I'm watching Steven Seagal yell, uh, talk to him now on the screen, but Steven Seagal's character actually, you know, hates him because that's how he lost his seal team. And Tommy Lee Jones does say, like, uh, I, now you're going to be forced to watch all these people die, right? It's like, I'm going to make yes. you pay yeah. and suffer, right? Right, exactly. And but still, he should have just... Yeah, I want to say I even heard that the commanding officer that um, Steven Seagal hit to get himself demoted to a chef, 
I want to say it was it was either Tommy Lee Jones or the other guy in the room, the Tom, the 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 guy that the yeah. head of intelligence. Yeah. So he hit one of them, and that's what got him demoted and put you know, and that's why he's serving out his time on the ship as a got chef. It. Okay. So that there's a whole backstory there that was really cool. I'll have to maybe hmm. find the audio commentary or something hmm. and listen to that again. Yeah. Um, the last cool scene, one hour, 36 minutes, 23 seconds, cruise missile, uh, full room engagement. You're on the back of the cruise missile here and it's coming down. And this is one where my son was like, why is it skirting the coast? Why does it just go up and over the land and, you know, like, cause it, it went because straight out of Hawaii. Yeah, exactly. It's like, cause it's a movie and you want to take a tour of the beaches. I don't know, but nice sound of being on the back of that mm -hmm. cruise missile, like a full room engagement there. Yeah. But then when it explodes, you get the explosion and that on the middle of the screen, nice explosion. Not like when we were firing the five inch guns. But then it splashes down and pieces mm -hmm. land. And there's dead silence after that, which em like really emphasizes all the sound that we were just dealing with being on the back of the cruise missile and then the explosion and everything. But then it just, it's over. Now, why did it explode? I couldn't figure that out. I mean, I know they... they Self-destruct. Uh, right. I thought it would just kind of like go off course and die into the water. It just splash into the water, yeah. Why the little... I mean, it was just a, and a then there's a parachute explosion. comes out of it. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> That's what my out. son said. He goes, it was a parachute. Was it? Well, they have a little Martian in there flying it. <laughs> like a little... That was a, that was a nuclear warhead. A, a so nuclear just... armed. Yeah. I don't know if that was one of the Tomahawks. Cause I thought they offloaded all of those. Maybe not. I don't know, but I, I know it's it a cruise to. missile. Yeah. Yeah. And it had a nuclear warhead. You would have figured they wouldn't blow up something that has a nuclear warhead. They would just splash right. it down. Right. Disarm it. Anyway. Yeah. No, but they, well, he does explain it because you have Erica Ellen, Miss July says, won't the nukes go off in whatever she said. And the way she says it, it oh, doesn't, right. it looked diff. It looked painful. <laughs> like she just had a hard it's time so getting funny. that line out. <laughs> <laughs> and then Steve said, no, it doesn't work that way. They yeah, weren't. Right. It, right. It's like, they'll just sink with the rest of it. Okay. Oh, and yeah, and there goes the parachute. I don't know. Maybe that's the black box inside it. I don't know. <laughs> Did you I just saw it explode. <laughs> the warhead. Yeah. I think uh, so we so can find funny. it easier. So definitely, I I recommend the movie. I'm I, As I said earlier, I'm giving a copy away. So I can't say enough about it. I just had so much fun with this. You and I talked about this months and months ago. Yeah. I could not wait to do this. It was killing me over the last few months to not sit down and watch it. I want because oh. my son I wanted my son to see it too. He'd never seen it. Uh-huh. So I was really looking forward to that. But yeah, it's uh so much fun. It's definitely worth watching for sure. Yeah. I, for me, this is like a good Saturday afternoon. You yeah. Know. It's raining outside, throw on this and just sit back and take yourself back in time. Yeah. Leave your brain slightly outside the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, Seagal's not making movies anymore. No. Right. And, they don't really uh, make these kind of movies anymore like this. And it's just cheesy, fun. Just, it's, uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, how, what, so I, you know, was, I was hoping, let's talk about the Kaleidoscape a little bit. Sure. Uh, did you already have it or did you buy it for this or did you rent bought it? it? Bought oh, it. you bought it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I went online and looked uh, at disc. I couldn't remember the cost of the disc, but it was enough. I think on uh Kaleidoscape, it was like 14 bucks. Yeah, it. it is so 14 99. Yep. Yep. So there you go. It's even cheaper there. So I'm hoping to be getting a Kaleidoscape soon. Working it out with the wife. we got a little negotiation going on. You definitely got to do it. I know, I, for, especially for someone like you who loves movies so much. It's, it's uh, well for me. It's like so. Here's a good. Let me ask you this, my buddy. He he loves movies like me. My buddy John. He's thinking about it, but he doesn't watch movies like I do. Right? He'll watch a movie a week, maybe. But I like to jump from movies and scenes. That's the ballpark that these, that the Kaleidoscape is meant for to me. That's how I recommend it. Because if you're just watching a couple of movies a week and you don't mind, all you get, you don't mind getting up and putting your disc in, then 
you would never really understand the benefit of a kaleidoscape in that aspect. I mean, there's other benefits to a kaleidoscape being if, if you have a high end theater that's, you know, you have masking, digital mask, or not digital, but manual or mm -hmm. uh, whatever you call it. Yeah. Automatic masking. Oh, Sorry. it's so locked into there's home so much automation. Stuff. You know, they just yeah. ain't to deal with a, uh, a company called, uh, Sonique. Sonique, the, the seat. Yeah. The, oh, yeah. So it will gorgeous. recline your seat as the movie starts. So they come yeah, on, yeah. So they've they they basically will will mark the movie, right? The movies the are seat. all marked for lights to come on, yeah. And so, so now it'll trigger your seat, yes, to go back and recline, and then at the end it'll come back into its upright position. <sighs> really cool. I mean, see, I don't think I can live long enough to get to the point where I could afford something yeah, like I mean, that. I, I mean, it's you're talking about insane amounts of money for the seating correct. and the, yeah, but yeah. it's neat that it's there. Yeah, just, absolutely. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and that's what I, I've, I've always loved stuff like that. Like even going back to early Kaleidoscape days of like back in the early two thousands, when I was talking with uh, Brett about it and I'm like, I've known about this company since it's, you know, outset mm -hmm. and their systems were 35, $40,000 mm -hmm. never would have, I, I couldn't touch that. Never yeah. even dreamed of touching it. But I still loved that stuff. I never, I would never look at stuff like that and go, ah, that's ridiculous. I'm like, no, hey, it's something to aspire to or try to do, try to try to duplicate it on your own in another way. And other yeah. people have, they've tried it. That's why we have the, you know, we have Plex, we have Zipedi, I have a Zipedi. And it's mm -hmm. like, there's other ways to do it. But that Kaleidoscape, it's just, uh, and now it is actually coming down. So, Hopefully yeah, I can get there. Yeah, plus the I, you know, being able to just buy that a copy of a movie and have it right quickly. Yeah, you have it, the terror system, right? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. So awesome. you have it in like ten minutes. Ten minutes, just oh, boom, there it is. So nice. Yeah, it's so cool. Nice. Yeah, you get that's definitely got to be that and Oro have got to be <sighs> just to, just to play around with it. Yeah, the, the Oro, the up mixing. Part. Yeah, yeah, I'm um, gonna try that. I'll definitely try that. I got to find a way. To, I got to download it and up to update my, uh, my, uh, Denon, but it can do it. I know that the, the updates out there. So check yeah. that out. Yeah. But, but um, all yeah. right. Yeah. Fun. Uh, yeah, by the way, the ending of the movie. Yeah. Where, uh, I forget what does Seagal say? He's like, I'll show you my move or something like that. Oh, and he kisses Eric. <laughs> it's so cheesy. Everyone's like, whoa, you know what it's, the way they're filming that, you could tell it's like the end, and everybody's coming up and kind of meeting. Seagal yeah, it's and almost like a hand. reach shoot, <laughs> it's like, like the after party. I know it's hilarious. Let's film the after. How about? Um, well, you're are you Navy or Air Force? Air Force. You grew up Air yeah, Force. Air okay. Force. So, do you, <laughs> my son noticed it, and he was like, "Why is she in a uniform at yeah. the funeral?" I know, and she's got the little tie on. I was like. <laughs> I don't know. Is that still left over from her costume coming out of the cake? <laughs> so ridiculous. I was like, I was like, uh, I, I thought that was, it was funny. I didn't really care about it. My son thought it was weird, but I didn't know if like any military people would be like, eh, that's just wrong. I also, know. I mean, there's so many moments in that movie where you're like, huh? Like when Seagal covers the, uh, the ship commander or captain up, you know, he finds him dead on the floor. Oh, finds him dead and covers and him with his, his coat. His jacket and car. I mean, yeah, yeah. In that moment, that's not what you're doing. Yeah. You're like, who's in here? You know, got to protect well, he, myself. I got to identify targets or whatever. I don't he's know. He's Steven Seagal. He's a Navy SEAL. He already did all that. <laughs> so how does this stack up to Under Siege 2? Have you watched that recently? Yeah. Uh, Under Siege 2. I haven't, like, watched it for its home theater part, but... Um, under Siege 2, I always... Uh, this one's better. Under Siege 2 is kind of the same. They're on a train in mm -hmm. that one. I've seen uh, it, but many, many years yeah. ago. Yeah. The scene from that one is when the girl... I think it was a girl tries to pepper spray the bad guy, the main bad guy, who's the equal to uh, Steven Seagal. Okay. They're both SEALs. I think they even know each other, if I remember right. But the girl pepper sprays him. <laughs> he just goes like this. He goes, eh. Like he likes it. <laughs> like... He's like, yeah, that stuff doesn't bother me because they're trained to have it, you know, to right. not, not be affected by pepper spray. Right. It's like, so. Oh, that's but, uh, funny. 
Yeah, it's wicked. Uh, but yeah, I, I I don't know. Maybe someday I'll get back. I don't actually own that one, but maybe someday I'll get back into it. I'm I'm curious to check it out just to see, you know, if it has a similar uh, replay value to Under Siege or or not. Yeah. Um, I did check out the uh, the box office takings for Under Siege. 150 million worldwide. That's not um, bad. Not, what did it cost to make? Well, I, Do you I didn't look at that. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. And on its opening weekend, it made 15 million, which is equivalent to about 30 million. Oh, wow. This day and age. So not Seagal terrible. was big. Seagal yeah. was big. So it's, it's not like people were like, you know, you know, didn't care. I mean, he, this was maybe his third or fourth big movie. I think after above the law and uh, all all the stuff that he did, uh, I can't even remember all of them because they were they all they did start to get cheesy. Um, but I really I always enjoyed them. I, yeah. I had a lot of fun with them. He's kind of like what would you call Seagal? Like him, Van Dam. They're kind of like the B list when you have like Action. Stallone, Schwarzenegger, um, uh, yeah, Bruce Willis. It's funny, Bruce Willis, that's how big Die Hard was, is that you oh, took yeah. a guy, that normal size guy, and he becomes an action star. Not the, the you know, the He-Man bulked up, Dolph, yeah. you know, a Dolph Lundgren size or Arnold Schwarzenegger size. He turned it into the everyman, which is what Steven Seagal ended up being. He wasn't even, like, he's not cut up. No. He's not, no, he's just an act, he's average. He's very slick looking, though. You know, yes. he's always like, he's always got that tan look and the, you yeah. know, they always make him look very clean. Yeah. Yeah. He does. Um, but he's like, like, if you notice like his shoulders and not cut, like when he, he's no. wearing a tank top, but he's not cut. You don't see that, that nice round shoulder that it's you like, would normally expect like in a, a movie. fatty arm almost. Yeah. You know? He's just under normal, like a normal guy, right. which you don't have the, you don't have the gratuitous ab shot. No. That you would get, you know, that he was just that normal guys like myself. I'd be like, I could get in a slap fight. That's me. <laughs> Him running though. Yeah, there weren't any really great running scenes. There were a couple. Not on a battleship. <laughs> there run. was a couple where he ran and he's like, tick, 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 tick. it's yeah. just I him mean, and Tom Cruise in a race. Oh, uh, hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> that I'd like to see. You know what I, I would like? To, you know, what would be even funnier. Them in a relay race and watching the two of them try to run and hand a baton to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they could pull it off because so they're just good. so like I Tom know. Cruise's arms are out to the side. And it's just, I mean, even he knows Tom Cruise jokes about it. It's like, yeah, I, yeah, he has that know. very upright too, right? Tom Cruise. Yeah. His shoulders go by. Yeah. Cause yeah. like I, I did a lot of running too for race. And it's like, it's funny. Like, your, your shoulders, if you want to run faster, try to put your shoulders out in front of you. And it's like, because running is basically falling, but you're catching yourself with each right. step. Right. But Tom Cruise is the exact opposite. It's like he's running right. like in a he's recliner. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It's Greatest so wrong. back in the world. Yeah. Right. But the movie portrays him going really fast. <laughs> it's like. It's uh. so funny. Yeah, it is. I was trying to, let me see, what do we got for for box office? You said box office. I'm trying to see if I can find the budget. Ah. Oh, let's see. Budget. 35 million. Estimated $35 million budget. Which, that's not bad. Wow. If it made 150. I'm actually surprised. That it was that, that was high? That that, yeah. No. Oh. I mean, not a lot, obviously not a lot spent on makeup. It's been, oh, no. we didn't even talk about that. The scene when Tommy Lee Jones gets the knife in the eye. Oh, so bad. That was, I, that, that was like, um, Terminator when, oh, uh, totally. remember the, the, the head of Arnold when he get and it's like, you could tell it's just a fake head. Just, yeah. And it was, I think it actually was Arnold's head that they used in under siege. It was that bad. It, it was, was bad. Like, yeah, it was bad. And then the, he just smashes his face through the, the radar screen yeah. that's like plate glass. Right. Yeah, he just puts his head in there because like we don't want anybody to see that because it just looks so bad. We just <laughs> throw right. him off to the side. Right. Yeah. But still yeah. fun. Yeah. I can't it is say a fun movie. Enough. It is. Yeah, I mean, it is. it's uh, 
You know, I always gauge it by, did I fall asleep? No, I did not no. fall asleep during that movie. <laughs> that's so a that's good, a good start. That's a good barometer. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you give this? Well, I lasted 45 minutes. <laughs> oh, all right. So the first 45 minutes, first 40, you're okay. And then you start to fall asleep. But yeah, no, yeah. I didn't fall asleep at all. Uh, lots to take in. Lot. I mean, obviously we went over all the scenes I found, the scenes you found, and like, or that jumped out to us anyways. And yeah. it's, it is a lot of fun. Um, what's the what would what's the next movie you would like to talk about? I want, uh, and I'm going to get you your the notes next time ahead of time so that you actually know. But what's um, a great movie you'd like to talk about? Oh boy, we came up like, with Under Siege organically, just us talking about Iron Eagle. Yeah, boy, and, and that Under Siege is just such a random, right. Are and you talking fun. like random movies or not? Yeah, random? just a, one of your favorite movies that you like, uh, like a that you think is a great home theater experience. Maybe that I haven't. Let's. Mm. What do you got that maybe I Hannah. haven't broken down? Have you Have you broken down Hannah? I haven't broken down Hannah yet. I don't think. I don't think I did. No, I didn't. Did I? But yeah, we could do that if I haven't done that one yet. It's I like funny. that I, movie. Yeah, it is. It's a good movie. It's a good. It's, it's a really, really good movie. Um, It'll be funny if I did break it down already for me to be like, I've, I've been doing <laughs> yeah, this over two years and it's like, I'm like, oh, it, like I, I, I can't remember if it was Hannah because there's a few female led characters like that, that it's just their name. Um, I can't remember if I did that one or I did another one, not Peppermint. There was a, right. uh, um, who was the, uh, was it Atomic Blonde? Right. Yeah. Yep. Atomic uh, Blonde. There... I, re- I, do, I broke that one down. I loved that movie. I really enjoyed that movie. Um, John Goodman. I thought he was really good. Uh, but yeah, Charlize Theron. She's, I love that movie. Yeah. That's a yeah, great they're... movie for HDR. We got the neon. You got such a good movie. And the Atmos in that is so good. If it's, yeah. that, it might be DTSX. Can't remember. I think but it's I definitely. I, yeah. I definitely broke that one down. Yeah, that's that a was... that's a sweet looking flick. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Eighties era. Did you hear that they're trying to? I've heard rumors that they want to cross that over with John Wick because she's basically John Wick. It's a basically John Wick movie, a female that. John Wick. And I heard people saying that they wanted to cross that over and do like a a movie with the two of them. That the two of them wanted to do it, but I'm like, yeah, but she's gonna be thirty years older because that movie took place in the eighties when the wall right. was coming down, right? right. In what eighty nine or whatever? It wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make sense. Like you'd have to age her or put him. I don't know, but yeah. Have you broken down John Wick or John Wick Two? I don't know. I don't think so. John Wick Two would be a good one to do. Yeah, that's I. I've clipped several of those scenes from that movie for demo purposes. They are just. Very dynamic. Um, See, that would be fun. You know, the next movie we should do. Hopefully, I'll have a kaleidoscape by the next time, and we can both watch a movie and set and share files. Yeah, because you can. Because I was thinking, I, I yeah, like I said, we've been talking about this since what September or whatever when you and I talked, and we were like, we'll do do this at the beginning of the year, and I'm like, all the while I was thinking that would be cool if I ended up if I could get a kaleidoscape by then and. It, you know, with the holidays, I just couldn't pull it off. But, um, but yeah, to be able to watch it, stamp it, and then send you and the then files. Share the scenes. Yeah, it'd yeah. Be, like you and I could, you could actually see what I see the scenes I'm talking about, and vice versa. That would be kind of fun. That would be a fun experiment. Awesome. So we'll we'll have to do that on the next movie. Hopefully, I'll have a kaleidoscape by the by the next time you're on, and we'll okay. have to share files. That would be okay. a lot of fun. That awesome. would be a lot of fun. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. All right. That should do it. That should do it. Uh, we've, we've been going for a little while now, Todd. <laughs> we have. Um, two hours, nine minutes, to be exact. Two hours, nine minutes, 40 well, seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to edit some out of here because we have that scene that I had to cut out for That's people. Right. So hopefully. Yeah, good luck and, to whoever wins that. You're going to enjoy yeah, it. That would be cool. What do you? What exciting do you have coming up at AV Nirvana? Uh, Review-wise? Yeah, um, you got that the, the the baby brother to the Yamaha. Yep, got the baby brother. Then I have a uh, Pioneer LX three hundred five receiver. Oh, That's where's that fall up. in the lineup? Flagship or midline? Midline. Okay, that actually might be their bottom. 
I have to check. Oh, entry level? Entry cool. level. But it's, it was uh, released last year. You know, I don't know. I have it. It's sitting in a box back in my workshop. <laughs> there you go. And they've been asking me, are, are, when are you going to do it? So it's coming up. Uh, that's coming up. I've got a, uh, a huge sub sitting over here from DevTech. Oh. Um, that I have to unbox and, and deploy. So that uh, is coming up. Uh, Storm Audio ISP Core 16 is coming Ooh. up. That's their new entry level uh, processor. Processor, um, which should be a lot of fun to play around with. It Ooh. has a new color screen on it. Uh, the difference between that and their ISP uh, 24, uh, 32 that I have um, is that it's not really upgradable. The one that I have basically as they upgrade um, componentry, you can just buy it and install it into what you have. Oh, okay. ISP 16 doesn't really have that option. Yeah, um, it's like you'd have to get a whole like new a receiver. unit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Basically. With the exception of a few few parts, they said they would be uh, upgrading on that. But for the most okay. part, they brought the cost way down to make it more accessible. Um, to get people into the market and then maybe so, so somebody like myself be like, hey, I'll try it out. And then mm -hmm. if I like it, you know, throw it on eBay, upgrade to something like you have. And then yep. you're off and running into that. You're obviously more money is more of an investment. But from the sounds of what you're saying is it's literally an investment because you buy the unit and then you can upgrade at a cheaper price in right. the future. Right. Yeah. And storm audio. I mean, you mentioned trend off. Mm -hmm. it, they are really, really sweet pieces of gear. Um, I think you can hear the difference. Really? I, Between I think so. That oh. and, a, and, a, and a receiver. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so it's basic. just so clean. And, and uh, as you advance volume, there's the noise floor is like non-existent um, and the processing power of these things are just, you know, they're just finely tuned machines. Right. Um, and, but not to take away from these amazing AVRs because no. they are also incredible. Right. Um, you know what I noticed about, so in video, so the reason I ended up with a Lumigen is because I saw, I saw flaws. Right. You mm -hmm. see flaws and you want to correct those. Mm -hmm. um, and you you're like, OK, I know I can do better here. I can do better. So you start to upgrade, whether it's a TV, you, you have a cheaper display. You see, I think I can make that crisper. I can make that better. Yeah. You see that audio when you don't know until you get to that next level. Because yeah. my room, like you said, like AVRs, there is nothing wrong with them. You can't hear anything no. wrong with them. It's no. it's it's Unless literally like. I mean, What's that? if it's, if it's underpowered, you can hear it. Yeah. If you're You'll trying distortion to, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. If you're trying to push it past its limits. Yeah. But if you're just running like my system here, it's not running past its limits. There's more mm -hmm. than enough power in the receiver to run my speakers. Um, I would say like, to me, I'm like, how can that be better? But what, like you said, with the noise floor, that's what you're getting rid of. That's the improvement. Maybe the sound, the sound might actually coming out might be the same. And I mean, this is very ignorant talk, but it's the absence. It's bringing, it's cleaning that sound is it's the difference. Cleaner. Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, of course there's different levels of processors. Um, I can't, uh, I've never, I can't, I can't say never. But for the most part, it's almost impossible to hear the difference between DACs. Like if you did a, a blind test right. between various receivers, it, I mean, it would have to be a really crappy receiver to hear the difference, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. There's, and Trenov is the same. Trenov is just an amazing piece of gear. Um, yeah. You know, and they uh, have yeah. their own room correction. Uh, Storm Audio uses uh, Dirac. Uh, okay. Yeah, you know, which makes a difference also. I mean, Dirac is really good. And uh, like the unit that I have has the uh, the base module. Yeah. And, and it manages four subs independently. It's not one channel split. It's four independent channels. Um, yeah. So there's those little things that when you, you start to fine tune, um, you do get a, a cleaner, punchier, more dynamic sound. Um, yeah. But just like that Yamaha that I was uh, reviewing over the last month. That thing can kick it really, yeah. really well. And somebody mentioned on on the uh, the review, one of the comments, 
you know, how does it compare to Dirac? <laughs> like, yeah, I can almost guarantee you that if you walked into the room and sat down, you wouldn't go, well, this doesn't have Dirac. I can hear it. I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> no way. No way. No. Um, yeah. You would sit down and say, wow, this is amazing. Right. I think, I think the difference is like, and my buddy went through this accidentally. Um, when you get into your room correction stuff, like out of the box, these receivers, they sound really good, mm -hmm. right? They do. If I got in my car and I drive to your house and I watch or a movie, I'm going to be like, wow, that sounds really good. Let me take this exact receiver, go home and listen to it in my house. Mm -hmm. It'll sound really good. But maybe in your house, you had the room correction on and maybe in my house, I didn't. And you would never know the difference between the two. Right. When you hear the difference is when in your room and you go from room correction to no room correction. That's when you, and it's a substantial difference. You can hear it. I'm not saying it's a huge difference, but it's noticeable. Yeah. And it, it, there is an improvement there, but you need to do it really quick. You need to be, or have listened to a bunch of content. And my buddy, he was using the um, Odyssey EQ and he kept doing it one on his, I think I told you about this one and he never uploaded it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, yeah. That. Right. So he I kept doing it and he did a bunch him. of room corrections and he had all these things and he, and, and here's, here's where it plays with your mind and not to make fun of him. Cause both, I know he listens to the podcast too, but we both have talked about this and it's like, when, when you do something, you're like, yeah, I hear the difference. That's mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And nothing was better. It's like drinking a non-alcoholic beer and getting drunk, right? Yeah. Nothing was better. It was playing with his head. But then after a while and actually he found out you have to upload it. And I'm saying like a year, he listened to all this content after a year, he found out that you have to upload the, the, from the, the app to your correction right. from the app. Yep. And when he did it, he heard the difference. He was like, Oh my God, that's a, it's a huge difference, right? His room got corrected and he's not in a dedicated theater. He's in a living room where correction really helps. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's like, he thought he had fantastic sound before, but that as, as painful as that is to go through, it's also like he said, a lot of fun because now all your movies are brand new again. Right. Right. And right. it's like, but that's the stuff like you were saying, like your system, you storm on awesome stuff. But I would, I watch a scene at your house. I come over here and I watch a scene at my house. Unless we set up the two systems here, that's when you're going to AB and that's yeah. when you're going to be able to be like, yeah. oh my God, that is better. But maybe you might notice, uh, I mean, the biggest thing that I notice in systems, various systems is the low end. Um, you know, if some base management, yeah, if, if base is out of control or muddy or too mm. loose or if the subs just suck and they they're bottoming out. Yeah. You're going to pick up on that really fast. Or if something's overly bright, you know, like under siege was a little bit. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's the content, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's the, I think the basic can actually like, if you're not managing it well, whether it's room correction, actual or room management, like sound absorption in your room. Yeah. It's like, uh, and I've had people say this, to me and you hear them on AV rant, they'll, you know, you, you do the nice room treatments and it's like my center channel got better. Well, yeah. Cause you're not fighting all that muddy base that's bouncing around in your room. You managed yeah. it better, you know? So it, it cleans up your highs. It cleans up the dialogue. It cleans up all of this stuff because you managed your base better, whether it's with room correction or actually treating your room correctly. Right. Um, huge Which is difference. really what your first step should be doing that. Of course. Yeah. I mean, the room correction is the last step. Um, yeah. Which but, is funny because if you treat your room correctly, the room correction is a minor upgrade. Yeah. Most of it, it's already done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's really true. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it, not everybody has the luxury though, of deploying treatments all around their room. I mean, you have a dedicated room, right? I have a dedicated room so you can put whatever you want into it. Um, yeah. If you're in a yeah, that whole room back or, wall behind me right now, that whole back wall, that's six inches of insulation with acoustically transparent cloth over. Oh, is it really? So yeah. it's just, wow. Just everything goes back there and dies. <laughs> so it, you know, and that, 
I mean, you have the, obviously you see the shelves and stuff yep. back there, the knickknacks and everything. You get some that, reflections off those, which is yeah, good. Some, to bounce some sound around, but yeah. it's, but most of your bass that's going to go right boom and just die right back there. Yeah. I know? have something very similar behind me. It's different. It's a, it's a, a, a slat. It's a binary slat diffuser that I created with the help of this guy in uh, Bosnia oh, wow. of all places. But it's, it's basically a giant, uh, it's like eight or nine feet wide, six feet tall with absorption. And then there are random, randomly placed uh, wooden slats in front of it okay. uh, that diffuse sound. So that's the binary part. It's, he, yep. you know, I generated a spreadsheet, ones and zeros randomly, and that came out. Then, and that's how I organized the slats oh, on this. Wow. And it's right behind my seating because my seating is a little close to the wall. Yeah. Um, and I was getting some bad reflection off the wall. So this hangs in front of my wall. Yeah. Um, very similar to what you have though, right there. You get yeah. some absorption, some diffusion, keeps your room lively, but you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it, it, doing that six inches back there, it big, di- I mean, that was probably one of the biggest sound improvements that mm-hmm. you can do for, yeah. you know, and it's just really, it's, I mean, you almost like double stud your wall, like, take two studs and that's what i ended up doing hmm. i pulled down the wall that i had up there i i double studded sideways the long way you know and then just stuffed it with insulation and then boop and just it it's that's cool cheap yeah cheap you know and it's like and the acoustically transparent black cloth i use just buy big sheets of it i put them on the frame because it's literally i framed the wall twice i framed it once mm-hmm. and then stuffed the stuffing and then framed it again put on the th- and just popped it up there and it's it's awesome huh. great improvement so yeah definitely uh, anybody listening to this that has not gone down that road that is a great road to go down yeah takes time though it definitely takes time it's like yeah. you, you and it's fun to get there because it's like what can i do next to improve my room yeah you know and it's like then you start doing stuff like that and you will hear a difference it's huge yeah and if you're lost uh, go to uh, like a, a website like uh, GIK Acoustics. They manufacture yep. room treatments. They'll give you free advice. You can yeah. upload images of your room, your room layout. Uh, they're really good folks. There, I've had a relationship with them for many years. And oh, uh, have you? Yeah. yeah, they've sent some stuff for uh, reviews, but and they've advertised on our website. Um, oh, cool. And it's a family-run business. Uh, they're down in uh, Atlanta, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, just really good folks. But Tom and Rob at AV Rant talk about them all the time. Yeah, they always push people there because people call like people write into AV Rant for you know advice on how on all this stuff, right? And they're always talking room treatments. Like somebody will write in and be like, "What's my next speaker upgrade?" And they're like, "Have you treated your room yeah. yet?" Yeah. And they always go there and they always, they go to Gick, they call it Gick Acoustic Acoustics and they always send them there and he, they rave about them as well. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I've definitely. never used it. I, I make my own stuff. <laughs> it's like, well, you can, you know, they sell supplies to make they your sell own. kits. Yeah. 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 You can they buy sell the, kits, the 703, instructions. the 705, you yep. can buy the frames um, and they'll give you advice on how to deploy it. So, yeah. um, cause it's not really something you want to just guess at. I mean, you no. can, you can do that that way and just do, you know, reflection points using mirrors and things like that. But, uh, if you want to get some expert advice, those, those folks are really good. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. That good, Todd? That's good. <laughs> My voice. I almost lost it there in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, your t- tumbler of water. There you go. Your t-shirt. Is that Black Rifle Coffee? It is. Look at like that. It? Are you yeah, gonna, yeah. My son watches. Uh, who's the guy there that does all the guns and everything on YouTube? And he had on a black black rifle T shirt as well. I know uh, Rogan talks about black yeah. rifle coffee, and it was so so. Fun. I mean, like I said, my son's into the guns and everything. But yeah, black rifle coffee. Yeah, I picked up on on. Uh, I I followed this guy named Jocko Willink. Jo- oh, I love Jocko. Yeah, Jocko is awesome, and he uh, he was talking about black rifle one day, and I went on there. And- bought some and love love jocko yeah love it. it's um what's this video that you play in the morning you know his uh saying uh when it, no. it's not just do it oh it's, good uh, good yeah 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 you broke your leg good yeah yeah, yeah. 
Good. I know. Now you're going to be stronger. You'll figure out how to get around it. He, oh, I love that video. He's got um, he's got Good. an album on Spotify called okay. Psych- Psychological Warfare. Because I, I like to get up. I get up at like 4.30 in the morning and hit the gym. Like him? Yeah. Like him. But not because yeah. of him. Mine is because of other reasons. My kids, yeah, life. early mornings yep. and life. But yep. um, yeah, he's got this uh, thing where you, you turn it on and he's like, don't hit the snooze button. No. Don't do it. Get up. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's great. It's, I, I went through. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were coming down off a mountain and uh, my son and myself and my brother-in-law we were, we'd done a three-day hike and we were banged up and i was like this is jocko willink this is jocko <laughs> willing time it's like my brother-in-law had fallen sprained his wrist um we, my knees were shot because i overpacked i was carrying a 50 pound pack for all three days and wow. I overpacked and I'm coming down and I'm like, all I kept saying, and I told the story to my brother-in-law, I'm like, you don't know who Jocko Willink is, but when you get home, Google it. And it's like, and I, we, I started telling him and it got us like a good hour of talk on a trail when you're miserable coming down off a mountain after three days. And you're yeah. like, I'm like, it's like your knees are bothering you. Good. Because you'll learn how to pack better next time. And we're like going around, we're slipping on ice and stuff. You slip slide. Oh, you sprained your wrist. Good. Good. You'll learn next time. And it was like, <laughs> but that's Jocko. And I love that stuff that getting up in the morning that, yeah. but good. It's a great attitude. It is it, him. And, uh, David Goggins is another, have you, mm-hmm. have you ever followed yep. that guy? The crazy yep. ultra marathoner Navy. Yeah. Seal? Yeah. Yeah. He's another guy, you know, mm. it's very I, inspirational uh, stuff to listen to, uh, that their stuff and Jocko's podcast. And I love listening to, uh, yeah. him interview folks i mean he's yeah he's great he's, he's really good yeah he, navy seal this is like i mean uh, rogan's always joking about him like you should run for president he's like and he doesn't even shoot it down no that no. would be scary <laughs> I know. well he's the guy you want to go to battle with oh yeah, you that's who you like, want go to battle for you i don't want to go with him yeah i mean he <laughs> but if you were going to be right, somewhere yeah. in, a, in a pinch you'd want to look yeah. over and see that guy yeah. That's that guy. That yeah. guy sitting there it's with you. Awesome guy. Yeah. I think if they made a movie about him, I think like Jason Momoa. <laughs> Don't you think Jason Momoa could play him? Yeah. He's that, was, that big. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, and, you you would not you talk about which uh, is jiu-jitsu. weird for a mm-hmm. seal. Yeah. Seals aren't usually that big. Seals are like normal looking people. They're mm-hmm. they're very smart. Very you know conditioned they know their stuff but um but yeah jocko's got it all <laughs> yeah it's like he really yeah he was born to do what he did what he does yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and what he does yeah yeah very good stuff yeah and it's funny too because he's the stereo he looks like the stereotypical seal like people mm-hmm. think seal and you think big badass mm-hmm. when in actuality and i've heard this but you remember the movie navy seals oh yeah with uh charlie, charlie sheen. sheen yeah and I remember when that came out and there were seals that were actually saying at that time, like, this is an accurate depiction because they didn't go for the, you know, the Jason Momoa look. They right. went, uh, every guy on that team. And what, what I heard seals saying about it was it, it's because they're just normal guys and, and they portrayed their intelligence too. Mm. Cause Navy seals are super smart. Yeah. Most of their training is being able to handle everything and still be smart and not panic. Right. Right. And it's like, that's the thing about Jocko. He's, it doesn't mean there aren't seals as big as Jocko, (laughs) but it's obviously, but most of them are just normal looking guys. Guys, a a tank. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's a great place to wrap this up. So definitely Todd, where can they find you and follow you and obviously go to your uh, blogging pages and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter, Twitter at AV Woofer. And uh, you can email me, Todd at avnirvana.com. And of course, uh, my website, uh, avnirvana.com. Come on over. Yep. Great Come blogs over, over there. Yeah. They do movie, Mike's doing great movie yep. reviews. Good stuff. Going to get him on yeah. soon. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Awesome guy. Yep. Going to get him on. We're going to have some fun. All right. Thanks, everybody. 
Wow, that was a lot of fun. Thanks to Todd from AV Nirvana for joining me. We had so much fun. Tangents galore, ended the entire thing talking about Jocko Willink, as you just heard. But if you guys enjoyed that, please follow me along on Twitter, at BrightsideHT. You can email me at brightsidehometheater at gmail.com. And if, we're on, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, really appreciate that. Questions, comments, send them to me. We'll talk about it on Tuesday on my audio only podcast where the listeners take over and all, we, all I do is talk about your questions, comments, critiques. How could I do this better? God knows I can improve. All of that, plus you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash brightside home theater. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters. That'll do it for this week. I'll be back on Tuesday. Next week we'll have another video, but until then, go push play. Hey Fred. This has been a Hey Fred production. With theme music by Jeff Bernhardt and Throne Vault Productions.